is the Suckers! Good evening, brothers and sisters of the leaf. Coming to you live from the Tipsy Void, a bizarre alternate universe where somehow old men are able to drink and party like they're still in their 20s for one night every two weeks before returning to the shattered shells they call their lives the next morning. It's the Tuesday Night Cigar Club Podcast. Tonight, the boys soak in the 2017 blood-soaked horror film, The Void, while smoking the complex JSK Maduro Shaggy Foot Cigar from Jossum Crawl and pounding down pint after powerful pint of Founders Breakfast Stout. Sounds like our lovable crew of Tuesday Night Heroes is going to have more fun tonight than H.P. Lovecraft at the slimy tentacled creature exhibit of his local zoo. So sit back, folks, light them up, and enjoy the show. Oh, there's that sweet, smooth, seductive voice, Mr. Fritz Beer. Missed it. Missed it. Well, I... I missed it until I heard it in person last episode. Our big 50th episode, last episode with Fritz Beer in attendance. That was crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to let you... All right. Our Man, couple. when you brought the water buffalo <laughs> in and the Incan priestess came in... My cover's blown. Uh, to y'all listening, this is... <laughs> We're actually recording this episode, which will come after our big 50th episode, before the 50th episode, because I think we might be so wrecked from the 50th episode, we might not ever be able to record another episode. But, technically, that means that this episode we're doing now takes place in the future. So, remember the butterfly effect. If you so much as squash... A gnat in here tonight, it could drastically affect the past. The, that, does it, that, that, that's not how it works at all. Does it work that way? I'm. All right, well, think about this, dum dums. This episode is in the future. Okay. So we can drink however much we want tonight because the hangover we have tomorrow hasn't happened yet and it will actually occur in the past. Dink. Drinky beers while you yeah. may, I, or some I, other time in the future. No, I'm, I'm just gonna go with my original supposition that no, that is not how it works. I'm so confused. No, I, I, I'm kind of liking the way that works though. Gather ye beers while you may. This is the, the last time. Set. Tonight is the last time I time travel with you, Killjoys. <laughs> And I need to start carving into the table no fate but what we make. I mean, <laughs> no fate but what we make. I carved that no on beer, our, but what I we carve make. that on this table every single podcast. It's just everywhere. Um, I'm gonna have I'm gonna hand you a knife. You need to show him. <laughs> show him the. I am positive that the last 50th episode of Extravaganza went extremely well. That I am sure of. But if you can hear me speaking to you now. That means not necessarily that we're still alive after the 50th episode. Because <laughs> technically, I'm coming to you from the future. No, the past. Should we start broadcasting this? Because then they'll receive it. Somehow, it will get into the past. We told totally- now. The same way that Prince of Darkness, they were picking up that radio. We totally didn't mean I mean, that's that's the only way I can see this. Oh, I want to talk about Prince of Darkness tonight. Uh, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just do tonight's show and just assume that we're still around to do a 51st episode after the big 50th episode. I like that. Does that make sense? Am I rich by this episode? Do you do you want to be? Yes. You're you a- are. You're actually very very sick. You're oh. Your positive thoughts will emanate forward, creating the destiny that you want. Yeah, you're actually positive for a lot of things. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club, episode 51. 51. We did it. Yay. We crossed the finish line. 51, baby. Um, <laughs> we, still, we were still here. Well, as, as far as you suckers listening know, 51. Oh. Sorry, guys. Um, hey, you get what you pay for it. Uh, yeah, well, 
Um, as you can tell if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, this guy to my right, Mr. Cody Lesker, across from me, Mr. Jason Tuttle, I'm your host, Matt Cade. Uh, he, he was running a little bit late tonight for good reason. We'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. we already started drinking. I got a ton of uh, beers here that aren't our beer of the night. No. You're over no. there still drinking some bourbon. My oh, bur- yeah. My bourbon's uh, gone. How's that bourbon? To, to it is fantastic. Uh, Weller's, I think, is that? Yes. Weller's, yes. Weller's. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we I like Weller's. It's got a nice little sugary sweetness. It's got a little sweetness to it. To it. It's a good sipping bourbon. I really like sipping on yeah. Weller's. Um, Tell us uh, real quick. Uh, this is breaking news. Well, by the time this plays in the future, everybody will have known this news. Can but you know what? News? Let's just take a minute to recognize our favorite pub, our home away from home. You guys won an award this evening. Correct. The uh, Music Association of Central Texas. They give out awards for musicians, bands. Cleanest bathroom. Cleanest bathroom. Yes. Did you get there? They no. We uh, Damn you, Bucky's. Actually, that award never gets won for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> no, it is Central Texas, and it is bars. <laughs> uh, you guys won third year in a row. Yes, uh, best uh, live music club. Best live music club. O'Brien's Irish Pub in historic downtown Temple, Texas. Congrats, buddy. Yes, I will admit I actually crossed state lines and voted in three different states for you guys to win. <laughs> that, that's not how it works at all. I hope I don't. So apparently your voting knowledge is as good as your science knowledge. I'm just saying, if you guys squash a butterfly in here tonight, there's going to be some, some shit go down. Yeah. Okay. And I, I I feel sorry for any butterfly that comes in here. <laughs> Such beautiful creatures. Why would they want to come into this place? Um, hmm. Flittering around <laughs> and then just drop out of the sky. It has been a while since uh, we t- talked. Uh, well, I guess... I don't know if it has been or not because the previous episode hasn't happened yet. I, I don't you know. You know what? I, I swear I I'm going to step away from all this time travel nonsense. Um, I'm possibly contemplating blowing my brains out. I you finished remember, remember, watching Iron Fist on Netflix the other night. and <laughs> Boy, you guys weren't kidding. It is just as terrible at the end as it was in the beginning. <laughs> still, still waiting. Still waiting for something. It's over. There's no more episodes. It's coming. It's going to get good. It's going to get good. Uh, you know, I, I brought up a point where we were sitting here waiting for you, Yak Boy. You're, you're much more in tune with the comics and and uh, the actual mythology of these characters that uh, Marvel digs into. Did Iron Fist ever incorporate the Iron Fist into his lovemaking? I don't think he did. No. Don't the Iron it, Finger? Don't think it was designed for that. Oh, look at this guy. Well, I mean, you don't want to go full Iron Fist. No, he'd start off with the Iron Pinky. Yeah, I mean, I would... <laughs> I would think you would be nice enough mm. to do that. What kind mm. of dick would just be like, here's my iron fist? Iron fist. <laughs> She's like, whoa. <laughs> hey. Come on. You bought me Applebee's. <laughs> let's, let's slow down with the iron fist. <laughs> What's up with that? All right. The iron index finger? Exactly. exactly. Uh, Start off a little bit. There was none of that in the children's comic books. None. <laughs> none. Shocking. Um, Shocking. Uh, I thought that might have spiced up the TV series a little bit. It's it's entirely possible. They showed Luke Cage. Oh doing man, all sorts how about of a dolly shot going away from the bed, and all of a sudden under the sheets you get the <laughs> yellow the glow. Light. Are we the only ones who find or if that? You heard funny? something start up like bzzz, she's like, put that away, baby. I'm the Iron Fist. <laughs> I am the Iron Fist. But then what if he couldn't get it going? She's like, it's okay, Iron Fist. It happens to everybody. Like. I just I gotta go in the bathroom and refine my chi. <laughs> it doesn't happen to me. I gotta just I give, to, give me ten I, minutes to refocus I my chi. Rebalance my chi. <laughs> I can't focus oh, here. Damn it! That never happened in the comics either. No. Okay. No. Um, Tuesday Night Cigar Club does not endorse Iron Fist. Not the um, show. Not the show. Not the show. I, I enjoyed say, the if character a, in the comic books, but he's not living up to that. If it's the German subgenre, I might endorse it, you know, depending on whether I'm drunk or not. But Oh, wait. No, the, not that fist. Oh. This is what happens when you leave us alone to drink for two hours before the show starts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, Iron Fist, the Netflix series. Uh, and I'm a loyalist, so I will watch every damn Iron Fist that's ever out you're there. You're goddamn fool is what that means. I'm loyal, and I will watch it, and I will hate myself for watching it. Loyalty has boundaries. That's something he would say when he's doing his stupid. Oh God! Pose. You mean while he's doing like some weird 
new wave dance oh, with the has its boundaries with what's her name and <laughs> while he's doing his tai chi. Oh, Gosh. it's terrible. But Blah. enough about that. Blah. Let's talk about happy stuff. Woohoo! We well, we've got we have a happy stuff. Pub of the year. Pub of the year. Let's go on and let's talk about a good cigar. Hopefully. I haven't had it, so... I have never seen this cigar <laughs> in my life. It's got a shaggy foot. It's, uh, it's broken. It's not broken. It, it is, is broken. I'm telling you right what now, What kind of broken. cheap cigar company is this that can't even wrap the entire cigar? They ran out of money. They did? No, uh, of course not. It's a shaggy foot cigar. There's tons of shaggy cigars is on the market. This is the Yasum Crawl, our number five cigar of last year. Yeah. Com- company, not blend. Yeah. Same company that got our number, the Red Knight... Yeah, Toro, uh, Yasum Crawl Maduro Shaggy Foot. What was the other one that we smoked this year that I had, I oh, really liked? Oh, the Sans, the Connecticut. Yeah, I really liked the Lotno Sans. I'll be honest, the Lotno Sans is the only cigar I've really flipped for on the show this year. So far, it's it's leading me. Well, that's one of the reasons it had been a while since we'd kind of uh, we've had we're two for two with Yasum Crawl. Yeah. Um, so, well, you guys are. I think I was like, kind of like mediocre on the Red Knight. No, you like the Red Knight. Go back and watch the episode. You I can't. Don't, re- I don't believe you. you. Can, these things don't lie, man. You said you liked it. <laughs> I don't uh, believe you. No, no, no. Uh, we all liked it. Um, this is a five by fifty robusto. Filler is Dominican, Peruvian, and Nicaraguan, with a Nicaraguan binder. The wrapper Mexican San Andreas. Um, it is a yearly release scheduled uh, to be available every August. He only makes a certain amount of them. And basically, when it's ready in August, he sells them on his website. Uh, this would be Riste uh, Riotowski. I'm going to fuck that name up again. Yasimcrawl.com sells them on their <laughs> website every August. And uh, they uh, sell out very quickly. So why is it just a, an August blend? It's when the leaves, the, the, the leaves are the tobacco there. is available. Uh, I think I'm guessing. I don't know. Um, possibly have to do with the Peruvian filler. I know. I'm that's, really kind of questioning, or I'm not questioning. I'm interested in that question whether he actually <laughs> uses Peruvian. No, I'm, I'm interested. No, I I definitely taste tea on the cold draw. That is a signature from Peruvian fill. I'm actually getting lots of tea on the cold. Exactly. Draw. Uh, it's amazing. I'm so, tea as we speak. Uh, yeah. No, I, I'm curious about Peruvian fillers because you don't really run across it that often in the cigar industry. I believe we talked with Saka a bit about Peruvian tobaccos. I totally don't remember that. Unfortunately, one. I was drinking. Yeah, I don't. I don't I, remember that. I, I do remember Saka saying that that you know there's a lot of fillers out there from different countries. I want to say that, that he get. vouched for it, saying that Peruvian tobacco got a bad name. Right. And he, and I remember he liked, him. And he liked it. I remember him saying that there's some Indonesian tobaccos. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of tobaccos that are out there in countries that are not normally associated with you know these cigar meccas. Correct. Uh, so no, but Peruvian. I'm like, that's that's an odd. Origin country. Uh, What's the is. origin story on Peruvian tobacco? Mm. Well, uh, that's all I'm going to give you. I actually picked uh, Riste's brain a little bit about the actual components of it, but he asked me to keep that a little closer to my chest. So, and you can't share that with your buds here. On oh, the I'll share with you when the microphones are off. But uh, it's probably wise. It was uh, as much just, bourbon as I've drank tonight, well, I'd be and, like, and, uh, "Oh, so that has spirit of." Okay, um, there's a, a, as noble of industry as it is. There's there's some chicanery going on. You don't wanna, you don't want to show your cards too much. I'm sorry, as noble as industry as it is. No, they're a bunch of bullshit artists. They don't divulge what their blends are. The smart ones don't. Exactly. Um, so that's all I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, limited release. Uh, we are fans. I know at least you and I are the Mexican San Andreas. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, let's just, you know, it what is the, it is a the, shaggy foot, which means the wrapper does not extend down the bunch. It's going to smoke typically a lot initially, right? Because you're burning just those those just, unrestrained leaves at the end, right? Um, but then once it hits that wrapper, usually it calms down, it cools down, down and um, I I can't tell you what to expect flavor wise. I can't tell you what to expect. Profile wise, strength wise, let's just. Let's I'm just shocked. See. I'm shocked. I'll tell you right now on the cold draw. I'm shocked that I get the tea. Uh, I really like that 
kind of sensation on there. What were what were the country origins on the fillers? Peruvian, uh, Peruvian, I believe, Dominican, uh, and Nicaraguan with a Nicaraguan binder, and then the San Andreas wrapper. Where's, what factory did these come out of? Do you know? Uh, Riste uses, and I'll I'll edit this if I'm wrong. Uh, he uses the the Noel Perez, uh, the same guys who made the. We featured their cigar. What's a goddamn cigar I couldn't pronounce? A Guayacan? Yeah, the Guayacan. Oh, that the, also got the highly rated. Guayacan. Yeah. Guayacan. Guayacan. With the Intubo rolling? Yeah. For the smooth airflow? Yeah. Guayacan? Uh, you know what? I, I'm, I, I'm fucking up that name. Do you want to be a quiet don't or a quiet can? Mm. I can't believe you went mm. there. I like it. I like Actually, it. as much bourbon as we've drank. <laughs> and, we, totally and we still have a whole show to do. It. We haven't even cracked open our, our main uh, beer. Noel, uh, dude, it's uh, Noel Rojas Sabadier. Okay. Uh, okay. Is the uh, the factory owner, I believe. Um, and who, they do also do the Guayacan... And, and, and all the the awesome crawl, and the awesome crawl. I lines. believe so. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Riste will let us know if I if I fuck that up. Yeah. Um, but all of a sudden the mafia shows up at your door. The Peruvian mafia. <laughs> Peruvian mafia. I'm not. I'm just I've saying. Been married for. No, that's <laughs> yeah. Sam Kinison. <laughs> Sam Kinison live. I'm just not. I'm not fucking with Riste. I mean, just. Oh, those Macedonians are. Uh, yeah, even if you don't like the cigar, it'd be nice. No, no, no. He's cool. Uh, we're always fair. Well, my name is Cody Lester. I'm going to be honest. Uh, in this golden age of social media, uh, I went to get tonight's beer, and tonight's movie. You, we try to work it in with the movie, and the tonight's movie is so fucking crazy. It's balls crazy. Uh, There's nothing on the wall that screamed to me. Uh, Unless there was an IPA called Balls IPA. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or just fucking crazy uh, West Coast IPA. Well, the only other thing that I would say, if you were trying to find some sort of theme, you should have went with bass. It has a red triangle. It does have a triangle. I didn't think about that. But... but so I what I, I don't did, think I think bass would not be no that, no. Thanks to uh, the golden age of social media, I could actually message Riste, the the blender of the cigar, the yeah. owner of the cigar, and say, "Hey, what would you s- any pairing recommendations?" And the first beer he said was this one. Uh, he, he there's a Ballast Point Victory at Sea he recommended, uh, Cigar City out of Tampa I think their brewery had one he liked. But dude, he said this and I. Our, our local spot actually had it, so uh, no tie-in whatsoever to tonight's movie. Uh, hey, sometimes we get it, sometimes, sometimes we don't. don't. Well, yeah. But technically, they're talking about children, and there's a baby on there. There's a little baby on here, but no, uh, it's a loose tie-in, but it works. Hey, uh, run with it. it. I believe it is the first time I've ever asked a cigar manufacturer what to, to, to drink, what to drink with it, with it. Yeah. and um, and he did it. So let's see how that plays out. I still haven't said what it is. That's your job. Tell us what we're drinking. Founders Breakfast Stout. Uh, made by Founders Brewing, which in actuality is actually named Canal Street Brewing Company. Founders is actually a, a thing that came about from them actually. The their, the first bottles that they printed, uh, the original label included an old black and white photo of the original Canal Street Breweries. Uh, from where they're located What's in uh, Grand Rapids, uh, okay. Michigan. Okay. And above that picture on their label, they would write the word Founders. Because where they're located, actually there was a number of breweries back in the day uh, located on Canal Street. Okay. And, of course, they went away. And then, of course, the, the new breweries are trying to start it back up. They were one of them. They started in 96. Uh Two gentlemen by the name of Mike Stevens and Dave Ingbers uh, began operations. And what year? I'm sorry, ninety six. Ninety six. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So founders uh, became their go to name, and then over time, as opposed to just calling it Canal Street, they decided they just change it outright and call it Founders Brewery. I'm just saying, sorry to interrupt you, real quick, but that pours black as oil. It does. 
Absolutely. It, uh, the beer we're drinking is uh, labeled as an Imperial Stout. They actually label it more as an Imperial Coffee Stout. Uh, okay. Uh, their own... Uh, I always thought that that kind of went hand in hand. Uh, not necessarily. The Imperial Stout uh, actually uh, started out as a English... Much like the, the English made the Imperial... The, the India Pale Ale. Yeah. Uh, so that it would survive the long trip to... The beer would survive the long trip to India on the ships. This was actually made to be a little bit closer to where it was going to more of the... To Russia and the surrounding countries. But their tastes were much different. They the, the they wanted a, a, a stout beer, a strong yeah, stout how beer. Hardy. And uh, at the time, they were making this style of beer... For the actual Russian court, uh, Catherine the uh, the second. It's kind of weird because I've I've never knew I've never known where the uh, term imperial came from on the imperial stout. The Ruskies. But I always had like in the back of my mind Russia, the Russian imperial court. Yes. For some reason, maybe it was the whole episode where we just got schnockered off of old Rasputin. Uh, <laughs> and, and, which is, we, and that and that's actually we that, reviewed that beer. Yes. Yes. That one was would that actually have been one? perfect for was tonight. Was that the Maggie episode? That was the Charlie Sheen biker episode. Oh. Nice. We got fucked up. <laughs> 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 that was a good one. But, uh, yeah, so this style of beer was made for that. And, of course, it's been... Uh, it's still uh, obviously made, and, and a lot of the breweries here have really started to... They jumped on that boat, and... Big time, especially the 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 crap brewers on the on the the coffee and yeah, yeah, the oatmeal yeah. side, not uh, more so the coffee side of it. Yeah, uh, a lot, the, especially the American crafters yeah. love the coffee on the imperial side. Uh, founders' own description of this beer is the coffee lovers' consummate beer, brewed with an abundance of flaked oats, bitter and imported chocolates, and two types of coffee. The stout has an intense, fresh roasted Java nose, topped yeah. with a frothy cinnamon colored head that goes forever. Okay, one, it does have the cinnamon color head uh, if you pour it without it. But if you get your nose like right down in that glass, everybody oh, stick yeah. your nose in it. I'm telling you, if you put your nose right down in there, you're 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 smelling Java. Mm-hmm. Which is not a bad thing. No, and I, I get a much better. Look at that cinnamon colored head. Yeah, especially when you <laughs> stick your schnoz right down in there. I actually drank quite a bit of the pint through my nose. <laughs> hey, has anybody ever done a podcast where we, they drink their beers through their nose? I don't really want Come to. Come on, boys. I'm not there. <laughs> Come no. on. No, no. Right. no. I, tr- I tried, folks. I, God forbid we'd innovate something. But um, uh, the Imperial Stouts tend to be uh, higher ABV. This one's a 8.3. Ooh. They usually say they... Nice. Wrong night. <laughs> Wrong night. No. Perfect night. Uh, they tend to say that they usually come in at around nine or higher. Yeah, I was going to say this is less, way less. The Rasputin is almost ten. But now, surprisingly, for Stout, this also has about a 60 IBU. Yeah, I dude, yeah. I that's what's saving it for me on these initial sips. I say initial sips. You my got second, a little bit of my hop. second one. <laughs> uh, I'm getting a little bit of that bitterness. That bitterness coming through. And there. for a guy who doesn't really like stouts, especially coffee stouts, uh, man, that bitterness is nice yeah. and unusual. Look how I, I black know, that is. That I don't is know just, if I. I don't know if I've yeah. had a stout with that that high of an IBU before. I like it. But Riste, I've got to say that you know you, your boy Skip. I see you giving Skip a lot of shit, and Skip giving you a lot of shit. You know he would look at an eight percent stout and go, "What the fuck, man." Skip, oh, be, but skip, the, skip. But bean. the Riste would go. That's why it's called a breakfast stout. I'm not even sure if that's a Macedonian I, I accent. Don't, I don't think Macedonians no. talk like Arnold. Uh, was that your Arnold voice? I don't know. It's, yeah. uh, skip Bean, uh, Roma Crafts uh, cigars, uh, founding father, who is a huge coffee stout fan. Yeah. As yeah. long as their ABVs are over twenty. But <laughs> uh, well, that's why Riste is like, of course, this is a Crom laughs stout. at your eight ABV. Um, it's not, it's not bad. I like it. I'll, I'll tell you right I, now. I, I don't like you, it. I knew you. No, love the it. the the bitterness isn't. I bet you love it. Extremely too. present. I do. Uh, it's got the coffee notes, but it's not like just you know, man. There's there's an interesting weird. 
powder sense this that's is almost nothing, in there on th- that This that is coffee. nothing that I would probably, you guys know me, that I would probably drink in a pub. Yeah. I am highly curious because it was recommended by the blender of our cigar to see how the pairing works. Um, I would order this in a pub. I wouldn't go to it all the time. I just I, I'm a fan of stouts. I I like the coffee. I well, like here's the, bitter, the thing too. But I, I also like a little bit more of the creamy side of stouts than the, than the coffee side. I say that too, but I think I also have to kind of remind our our. I don't remind our listeners. I think they know by now, but others. You know, when we say we wouldn't go to it regularly at a pub, I think a lot of people go to the pub and try something new. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then maybe go to uh, something that they're familiar with. Yeah. And after those two drinks, go home. <laughs> yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> we we no. do that. Uh, we, we, we tend to, the oh, way, that's really good. Let's see how it tastes 10 pints from now. The way I, yeah, the way I kind of approach my pub visits is that I will get the first beer I'll try to do something that I haven't tried before. Uh-huh. Uh, this, if it's just way out of my wheelhouse, do you wheelhouse, ask the O'Brien staff for recommendations? Absolutely. Uh, like I will. Well, the way I no, uh, I'll admit no that I don't because you know there's you're a, an internet beer expert from the podcast exactly, and I don't want to be shown up by the O'Brien staff. So basically, what I'll do is I'll look at for something new, and I'll be like, "Oh, tell me what that Golden Pyramid beer is." And then they'll tell me a little bit about it, and I'm like, man, that really sounds like crap. Give it to me. <laughs> and then I'll try it. I mean, because everybody's like, well, we can pour a little sifter of it here and, you know, you know, take this little sifter and tell you what I think. You can't tell a beer from a sifter. No, you cannot. Get you a fucking pint of that thing and own it. I mean, if it sucks, just own it and drink it. It's a pint. What's it going to do to you? At the, at the very end, it gets you one step closer to where you want to be. Yeah. So uh, I usually start out with like a beer I've never tried before. Uh, if it really shocks me and I'm like, oh, this sucks, then I'll go to something that I have tried before. And then on the third beer, it's really interesting. If I have struck out with the first two beers, I'll usually go to Guinness. That's my comfort zone, my you love security it. blanket. And then, but usually what will happen is that, you know, the O'Brien's people will put me onto something that's kind of interesting but not really in my wheelhouse and then by the third beer i'm starting to get a little bit okay enough to where i start just drinking whatever crap they sell me do you hear that i do and by crap i mean quality outstanding Uh uh-huh uh-huh apricot infused Mm, ipas i like it no that's horrible a lot of apricots i I like it but I am an IPA guy. Anything? Uh, I turned you on to him, and you ne- you haven't looked back. What? Yeah, I, some, I, for some reason I, I'm pretty sure that you did not. I got turn one of those Cody Facebook on. reminders about like three years ago. Three years ago, you had an it, it was one of our first episodes, and it was it was like, well, you know, I'm a whiskey guy. I don't really drink beer, but I'm gonna try to do it for this <laughs> podcast thing. <laughs> now I'm just I'm an IPA man. guy. I'm just, Every morning I'm gargling with it. I can't get enough crap beer. It's just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, anything else, Yak Boy, about the beer? Or uh, oatmeal, chocolate, coffee, deliciousness. Correct. Where was, where was the city again? No, Michigan. Grand Rapids, Michigan. 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 I believe that's where Ted Nugent's from. That was. I'm just saying that out of this cigar, I taste a lot of Nugent. It's it's cool. You get Nugent? Yeah, I get a lot of Nugent in there. A little caramel, some Nugent. I wanted to stop. I wanted to uh, talk about the cigar once we all got down because it it smokes for about five minutes before it actually hits the wrapper. And Um, it does smoke. Oh, it is. There is nothing containing that smoke. There's no wrapper there. It's basically just a fire. Yeah, I mean it's a shaggy foot. It's going to burn that tobacco. Um, but the minute it, but it's not like a smoke. No, fest. no, no. It's, not it's like it's, a smoke bomb. It's, no, it's not. It's like there's some Drew cigars that the moment you light, of it, course, you need a fire extinguisher right there for you. You do. Uh, this totally isn't that. No, no, no. Um, the mine just now hit the wrapper. Yeah, I think maybe this pairing might work. Yeah. Did you retrohale. 
I just say that there's man that that tea flavor is consistent even after the light. Uh, I haven't got to the wrapper yet. Still getting tea, huh? I'm still getting green tea. I am getting. Uh, I, dude, you know what? I am getting a little green tea. I'm also. Uh, yeah. I'm getting some cedar. Um, now w- wait till the wrapper hits. That's where the cedar will come in. Um, I'm also getting a little cream. Now that this, the the wrapper is working itself into it, um, I, I mentioned earlier. I mean, I'm a big Mexican San Andreas fan. Yeah, yeah. When it's when it's uh, when it's a nice a nice Mexican wrapper, um, I gotta think because that tea is such a unique. Are you getting the tea? I am. I got it. As a novice, as a non blend I gotta give it to Peru. Peruvian. I gotta give it to that's, Peru. That's the one tobacco filler that we're unfamiliar with, and oh, all of a sudden, correct. It's kind I, of I, I've, I've got to give that to Peru. All of a sudden, Mistay is like, "Dude, that's totally not it. You fucking novices." I will say this uh, for a shaggy foot: the minute that wrapper started burning, uh, straight burn line, it just picked it up and and completely just. That's where the shaggy started. It's it's. A uniform ash. Um, yeah. Give it a minute. Sit with your thoughts for a little bit, boys, with the beer and the cigar. I'm getting um, a little bit of that cream. I am getting that cream. And I hardly ever get cream. Actually, last episode you said, or I'm sorry, two episodes again, because we're in the future, you said you never tasted cream in a cigar. Yeah, that's totally, and it's got a little hint of cinnamon, too. But that's yeah, all. Right. That's all retro hell too. No, that is, well, you know, it's part of the deal. I'm not getting uh, any. Well, I mean, right just now, as, a, as a retro hell expert, <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm, just, I'm getting as an internet retro hell expert. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the cream, the cedar. I'm getting the the really nice tea. Uh, yeah. So far, so good. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce the film tonight, boys. Uh, since uh, it's shit, turn your podcast off right now. Why not? Tuttle's got some things to say about tonight's film, and I've been, I've been stifling him till you showed up, Yak Boy. I've been, shut up! Save it! Shut stifling, up! Stifling or stifling? I've heard it both ways. Yeah. I would go with stifling. Stifling. 2017's The Void. Written and directed by Jeremy Gillespie and Stephen Kostanowski. Uh, they don't have much directorially under their belts, but they have a history... In both the art and makeup departments on major films. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of another film we did on the show, uh, Deathgasm, who the director was real big in the visual effects world, like yeah. X-Men yeah. and huge movies before he uh, stepped behind the camera yeah. as a director. Uh, both these fellows are members of Astron 6. Astron 6 is a Canadian film production directing company founded in 2007, 10 years ago by Jeremy Gillespie and a guy named Adam Brooks. Uh, They're known for producing low-budget, 80s-centric kind of independent movies, a lot of horror movies, Uh, horror movies with comedy. Yeah. Kind of made their own little trauma studio up in Canada over the last 10 years. I don't use that disparagingly. I just mean in-house. They use the same six directors, the same actors, the same... Uh, they did one on Cody. You might have we might have thought about doing this on the show at one point. Manborg. Oh yeah, they did Manborg. Uh, they did another uh, slasher, th- I think, film Father's Day, but very very uh, low budget but creative uh, horror movies with with comedy infused. Uh, Gillespie and Kostansky directed tonight's film, uh, The Void, intending it to be a departure from their more. Uh, Astron 6 is more comedic work and also showcasing Kostansky's creature and practical uh, special effects. Uh, these guys, Astron 6, have been on my radar for a while. I've wanted to see. I, I haven't seen Manborg. I, I didn't see Father's Day. But I, I, I've known about them. And uh, this probably isn't the best entry point into Astron 6 because it's so different, apparently, and much more straight. Straight narrative, uh, less bullshit. Humor. I was about to say when you talked um, about the being humor, there wasn't a no, lot of humor this, in this. this there this, wasn't any. Humor this was their in this. departure, and this is the first one I've seen. This is them um, trying to go legit. So I'm kind of curious horror. to go back and look at some of their 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 other stuff. I wish 
somebody in Texas would start a director's collective and invite me in. They do have a director's collective, and yeah, not, they don't want me. <laughs> <laughs> they hate me. Fuck that Tuesday night crew. Matter of fact, I could. They have a cinematographers collective, and they were like, "Dude, if you would just ditch him." Oh, ditch me? You didn't. Oh, ditch him. Yeah, Cody. Oh, shit. Well, <laughs> I guess I'll just sit here silently. Oh. How you guys liking the scar? <laughs> Before we get in this film, I, 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 I think the pairing is working well. So far, so good. I like it. I will say this. I'm that- glad I I'm glad I'm I'm retrohaling this because Oh you got to, buddy. There's all a- the flavors are coming through the retro hail. And that's what's pairing well with the Imperial. I'll tell you what's weird is the that cream I'm, especially through the retro hail. And I'm losing the coffee on the stout. Uh the coffee dominance of the stout flavors. Yeah. When the cigar flavors meld with that coffee or with the Imperial stout, I'm the coffee takes a back seat. Uh, I'm getting a bit more of that sweetness, that tea sweetness, with a little bit of the the cinnamon flavor through it, uh, which is you know downplaying that coffee. The cigar flavor through the retro hill is kind of manhandling the imperial stout flavor. I'm getting nothing but cream, cedar, and tea. Yeah, um, both through the retro hill and and and, and through the drag. And I'll admit, the first pint, I wasn't really feeling the beer. It's just not my, not because it's bad beer. It's just not my style. It's not your style. Um, it's really mellowing out the beer for me. Um, yeah, I, it's funny when it hit when the burn line hits that wrapper, you get more of a traditional smoke flow. Profile. Well, that, dude, that's crazy because it's just loose leaves hanging out. Yeah. The fact that it could stay uniform to where when it hits the wrapper, it just makes a perfect straight burn line. Just from a physics standpoint, that's impressive. They know what they're doing. They know is what they're doing. It, they is it? Doing. I feel bad about saying Guinecon wrong all those years. <laughs> Do you feel bad about saying it wrong right now? Guinecon. 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 Why you can? I actually think I was saying it right. You guys just give me shit. No, no, you weren't saying it all wrong. Have you seen what we drank before you even showed up here tonight? This no. is what we're in store for. This is what's happening. Just don't flip over the table tonight. It's no, no, no. no. It's not one of those nights. At least let me clear the mics off of it. First. <laughs> Promise. I'll give you. I'll give you forewarning. Uh, I am liking the cigar. It, it's a very, you know what that. Uh, what's surprising for a Mexican San Andreas wrapper, usually it has that little bit of spice to it. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm not getting that so far. It's 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 muted. It's there, but it's 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 so subtle. Really, the the cream and the 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 tea and the cedar are dominating that spice. I'm wondering if that's going to pick up at some point. It's man, it is there. It 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 is so like you said, muted and subtle that But it gives you a nice kind of cool. It gives you a nice <laughs> little burn on the on the yeah. back of your throat. I like it. I'm gonna say instead of cinnamon it's more like Indian cardamom. Or is it cardamom? I don't know. Yeah, well you do me a favor real quick. Can you reach over there and uh, punch him square in the nards? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, it's like poppy seed. Poppy seed. I was going to say more like a paprika, like kind of a, a Indian spice. No, no. Paprika is way too smoky than this. I've never had paprika. I was just I was trying to impress you guys. <laughs> I've had paprika. It was nothing like... I was just joking. It is... It's, come, over it, to our it's, house, it's, come over to our house more. You'll have more uh, uh, paprika. Paprika pancakes. More commu- <laughs> cumin. Uh, it's interesting. Anything? Any thoughts on a cigar and the beer before I move on? Not be, at the moment. It might be a little while before I get back to we'll it. See. I really think the cigar is balancing out the things that are overpowering for me in the beer. I agree. I, I, I think that... I'm actually tasting more of the oatmeal in the beer since I started the cigar. The coffee's a little bit muted. Uh, I never really got much of the chocolate in it. Um, no, I haven't got any chocolate uh, in the beer. But, you know, that, I, something about that overpowering coffee kind of turns me off. Boy, this cigar just squashed it uh, in a nice way. I can't remember a cigar ever 
really stepping up to a beer and putting it in its place. I like All it. Right. Okay. Oh. Well, uh, the movie is The Void, 2017. I'll give you a little background on the filmmakers. Uh, let's get into the film. This film is uh, in my little horror world of online uh, people that still talk about horror films like they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, a lot of people talking about this film. I really was antsy to dig into it. I'm I'm actually curious about that because I've often wondered like where has the non saw the non purge horror films gone. You know, we're and a, you're and you're always telling me no, they're out there. No, they're real, just not mainstream. Real quick, we're at a weird point in horror where Fangoria magazine is gone. Uh, a lot of the other stuff is strictly online. Uh, there are still some print magazines. Um, you got to seek them out. But you know, I come from a, I, from my twenties and thirties. Every weekend was going to the bookstore and trying to buy up all the copies of Fangoria and Rue Morgue and scouring through them and see what all these new movies were. And hell, a movie that you had no kind of sense other than what you read was about. You would have to order the DVD in early two thousands. I'd pay 20 bucks right. to get a DVD of the movie that I had no clue if I would like or not. There was no video on demand. There was no... You just, you just, you're craving content. You're craving good genre content. And those entities like Fangoria and Rumor Magazine and Whorehound were kind of your gateways to that. And the, they're not really that present anymore in a physical sense. They're more online. Right. You know. um, but... The Void has kind of permeated into mainstream but film criticism seen- and mainstream things. And when it gets to that point to where it's not just the horror nerds talking about it, but actual you know non-horror sites talking about yeah. it, that's what kind of picks up the radar. Like, you know what, maybe... I think it's interesting is that you've had a bit of play on the horror comedy scene for like the last five, six years. And it's, I think that might be the gateway genre into the actual horror deal. For guys like you, yes. For me, yeah. For yeah. guys like you, that's for a me. huge thing. Uh, the zombie guide to the apocalypse. The Shaun of the Dead. The death gasm. You got the death gasm. Find a hook that you got, you know, oh, heavy metal guy gets... Yeah. Or, you know, a slacker falls in love with a zombie. But even then... For a non-horror I mean, you guy, in, that could be your, your hook. But also you come in with the thriller aspect of it, the devil's candy, and I'm like, oh, I love the devil's candy. Well, let's move into more of a horror-type deal. Well, this is straight-up horror filmmaking. Uh, straight-up genre filmmaking. No horror comedies. Uh, no bullshit. No bullshit. This is, <laughs> yeah. a, this is a straight-up horror movie. We haven't done one of these in a while. Cody, do you devil's like straight-up horror stuff? He doesn't. Not, not, not necessarily. necessarily. Not okay. This one was. All I right. mean, this one was a little different. I mean, it, it. You know, obviously, we'll we'll get to it here. But I mean, it. It. In terms of its tone and. You know, it drew from so many. Other wells. You. you it, it. It doesn't wear its influences. I just want to make sleeve. sure it, it. It. It holds them up on a silver plaque. I just. Right. I just want to see where everybody's from. Make sure I'm on the same page before we start gutting this thing. Uh, and we will gut. We got everything. It's not a bad term. We 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 rip these movies apart and see all the black stuff inside. Um, but uh, yeah, this is not necessarily something that you would go to and say, "I got to see this." It's definitely not something you would go to and got to see this. Um, but this was definitely one for me. I'm like, hey man, if I'm gonna drop seven bucks on a video on demand rental, we're gonna do it on the show. It was a little bit more pricey. Uh, you guys, Amazon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. six ninety nine, uh, seven bucks for, yeah. but for like a a week long rental, which yeah. is nice. Yeah. Usually, the stuff we rent is like a forty eight hour rental tops. Uh, they get, they at least give you like. I get the forty eight hour. It's only five bucks. Get out. <laughs> get Sorry. Out get out of here. Sorry. Well, it's nighttime as our opening scene finds a young man named James. Hauling major ass out the front door of an old country house. Uh, he's followed by a young girl who's immediately shot in the back by a rifle. Crumples down the ground uh, just as she reaches the bottom steps of the front porch. She collapses the ground as two men emerge from the house. The older man with the rifle, we're going to call him the father. All right. Uh, hands the younger man, we're going to call him the son, uh, a gas can. 
and the son proceeds to douse the wounded woman in gasoline. Well, the it's dad, a hard scene. The dad lights up a cigarette. I'm going to talk to you about how well, hard. And, it is. I, and the whole time, you know, the great thing here is, you know, they're not really showing her. Uh, right. He's at their feet, and you just hear this crying and this 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 sort of pleading. I'm going to talk about and, this in a second because I kind of disagree with you, boys. But it's interesting because you got the uh, the father who's just hard as nails. Throwing it down. The son is, the clearly, son is conflicted clearly conflicted as he's dousing there with gasoline. It's a little bit overacted on the on the conflicted well, part. Well, the father lights up. Believe, a, I mean, it's the I, father lights up a cigarette. I, 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 I disagree with you guys here, so I want to get to it so I can kind of yeah. Uh, the father looks out into the distance and says, "The kid on the run won't get far." Yeah, and then he takes one big drag on the cigarette, tosses it down on the girl's body, which immediately goes up in flames. And that's where I have a problem. You guys seem to think it was an effective scene. I didn't think there was it's enough a, screaming from her. I didn't think when they dropped the cigarette on her, well, they come I mean, to a wide shot, and it's like they're have. watching a campfire burn. There's no movement in the flames. Yeah. That scene could have been so much more harrowing if she was screaming and you saw an actual body on fire. To me, it, to me, it didn't need to be oh, I that way. For an opening scene of a movie... To set the pace for crazy. Well, you're like horror experts. I needed in to it. hear more screaming, more movement in that fire. It just looked like they were watching trash burn on their front yard. Yeah, I needed more. I needed to sell that. I more. actually weren't they Cade though? Weren't they? the the moment? I, that, I, I wasn't feeling it. The moment that they were splashing her with the gas. That was enough. That, that, Just that, that act. That of was enough. Pouring gas on a girl. Now, where where it lost me is the cigarette toss to light it. That to me, that was cliche and over the top and I, I would have been okay with like, it if she had actually screamed in pain and we had seen like a, a flaming figure on fire yeah I just thought it reeked of low budget that they just stood there and watched just well a, you just said it was low budget no I didn't say it was low I don't know what didn't the budget you? of this thing was oh does anybody know what it was possibly I, relatively low budget but you, you, you could make some movement in those flames I would think and add some screaming. The screaming is not there once the fire. It's just yeah, it's, it's yeah. just a dead fire. And yeah. I kind of thought that was like, man, this could have been a really cool opening scene. But it was, it's like, man, you kind of lost a little something there. Not that I want to see young women in flames. I was about to say, you're kind of scaring pain. me right now. I I'll mean, set you on fire later. See, it's, <laughs> we'll see how. It's, Trust me, there'll be lots of screaming. I'll see how it's really. It'll young. sound I'll, just like a young woman. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, well, after a quick opening credit sequence where we're shown glimpses of the surrounding area, an old hotel sign, a blinking uh, radio tower, all at night, uh, kind of just atmospheric moonlight lit small town stuff, we're introduced to Officer Danny uh, Daniel Carter, played by Aaron Poole. Who Kill we, Graves. Who we've seen before in what on the podcast? You know. What, you what? Know, what? He was the lead actor in a movie that we <laughs> reviewed on this fucking thing. The Conspiracy. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, he played the... Uh, he was the hipster yeah. the guy that got sucked into the Illuminati and refused to shave for the... Yeah, I totally did. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> Wore the jacket and, and everything. now he's an unshaven, long-haired hipster doofus cop. I didn't, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, he's he's the lead dude in the conspiracy. For some reason, when I when I see him in this, I see Kilgraves from Jessica Jones. Maybe his son. Yeah, Kilgraves old. Well, he's, I looked at him and I was like he's just like a. For some reason, I saw him and I'm like, only I can. I don't know why I thought this, but all I could think was like, he looks like he's like. A really like the son of like George Lazenby with his hair like <laughs> slicked over, <laughs> his long slick back hair. He's unshaven. Which looks nothing like a police officer. And remember how we had problems with him in the conspiracy? How he wouldn't shave? Yeah. Uh, or try to like change his look. So they're like, we really need you to just shave and look like a police no, officer. This, this no, actor will you. not change his... All right, I know you wouldn't do it for the conspiracy. Will you shave for this police officer? Well, nope. We need you to shave and get nope. a buzz cut? No. Grow a mustache maybe? Uh-uh. Nope. Nope. Uh-uh. No. No. I am the opposite of Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> The role becomes me. I don't become the role. <laughs> All right, Aaron. Well, we that said though. Well, we I'm got like, the best we could with the funds available. <laughs> that said, I like he's the only young working actor in Canada. <laughs> but I like this guy. Uh, I I don't. I like in, in the, at least in this role and this group of actors. I like him. 
Okay. No, I didn't. I didn't. Re- I didn't really realize that that yeah, was. Yeah, that was. I totally. Yeah, I totally. There did was not other guys in the connection. film that I was like, uh, oh my god, uh, no, little moments. They're little small guys. I reckon. Really? Uh, tiny. All right, we'll get into that. Well, we join the unshaven police officer Carter as he half sleeps in his patrol car on a quiet night on the outskirts of town. Uh, just as he's about to call an end to a shift. Uh, the young man from the opening scene that shot out of the house, James, crawls out of the woods on all fours, and he's in really bad shape, barely breathing. Uh, he's, he's, he looks rough. So Officer Carter gets uh, James in his patrol car, and they race towards the closest hospital, Marsh County Memorial Hospital, uh, which dispatch says is running on a skeleton crew after having suffered a recent fire. Yeah, uh, It's in the process of relocating... But the next nearest option is like 20 miles away. And like, it's your call. But he looks in the back seat and this guy's in, you know, he's like, all right, fine. We'll go to Marsh County. He's not happy about it for reasons we'll learn later why he did, why Officer Carter doesn't want to go to Marsh County. But he doesn't have much choice. So uh, Carter carries James into the emergency room at the hospital where he's greeted by the head nurse, Allison, who happens to be Officer Carter's ex-wife. That's why he didn't want to That's go. why he didn't want to go there. And another nurse named Beverly. As they rush James back on a stretcher to see Dr. Powell, uh, Carter takes a seat in the waiting room with an elderly man, Ben, an old guy, and his pregnant granddaughter, Maggie. Uh, he knows, uh, Officer Carter knows the doctor. Yeah. He knows the old man, Obviously Ben and Maggie. Obviously, it's a small town. Super small town. Everybody knows everybody. That They do a very good job of establishing yeah. that quickly. I'll give him that. Uh, in a nearby hospital room, a young Asian nurse in training, Kim, is hanging out in the patient's room, and she's showing him gruesome surgery pictures I in her hate textbook. This nurse, he, he, she's a hot little Asian. He's trying not to seem too grossed out, but uh, Asian nurse in training. All right, one. That's a script, by the way. I wrote Asian in the 90s nurse in training that should be made. Uh, that can't be made now. She's, she's just terrible. Uh, first of all, she is super hot, and she is super terrible. There is, every time she's on the scene, I'm just like, really? You couldn't find anybody? I know she's hot, but you couldn't find anybody better than this. This is, this is bad. I her that hot. She's I cute. I found her just incredibly untalented. As no, well. she was not. It was one trick. Yeah, boy, untalented as an actress. Yeah, we kind of liked her. Yeah. Once again, kind of liked her. They, you just they, liked Asian nerds. Yeah, it's got a little yellow well, that's, fever. That's, that's different. I could tell that they it's spent their money people. on other things. They did spend their money on other things. <laughs> Look, we just need a warm body to fill this thing. Get somebody in here. By the this way, this person is so bad. But she is so bad. She is so over the top. I mean, it was just. There is no way any human can act like this in all of her situations. And well, not if maybe if there was some way we they could just shove her into a closet until the movie was over. Oh wait! Oh wait! Did you did you read my script, Asian Warm Bodies? No, I didn't. So much work that you haven't let me see. Well, I, well, th- I will say this. There's for, a drawer. I will say <laughs> this for Hollywood. At least they hired is Asian that what's on in that this filing one. Cabinet? Normally they don't. This was not Hollywood, my friend. Oh, this is Canadian. Canadian. This is Canadian. Canada. No wonder. Um, okay, well, enough about Kim, uh, the Asian nurse in training, which this is the one time I'm not excited about saying that. Um, <laughs> rant alert. I'm going to rant for a second. Oh, God. I don't do it a lot here. Uh, you do it on every, like, every podcast. Let me take a drag here before. This is a big rant. Holy Juju crap, did- we're at the same pace. It is a robusto, so and I am I'm you know I'm making a concerted effort to uh, smoke slow, and I think maybe you are too. Well, so, I think I've lit up like ten minutes after you did. Did you ding dongs uh, notice what movie was playing in that patient where Asian no. nurse and training Kim? No, you would not. Did you notice what I movie was playing on the TV in the patient's room? What movie was playing? It was George Romero's Night of the Living Dead was playing in black and white on the patient's TV room while she was showing him her, her gruesome textbook photos. Interesting. So you get a seize, mo- a seize movie. Siege. Siege yeah. movie. A heavy je. A je. Okay, so you got a siege movie playing in the background of that's, a siege movie? That's not what bothers me. 
What bothers you? It is a pet peeve of mine. <sighs> Due to a careless mistake when producing the film prints of Night of the Living Dead back in 1968, uh, the film went out to theaters without a copyright notice anywhere on the credits. So or they can, any legal thing. So, so can, ever since it was released back in 1968, anybody who wants to can distribute the film. I could put out DVDs of Night of the Living Dead right now and sell them. Really? You can show it. You can remake oh, it man. without George Romero, the godfather, inventor of the zombie genre, seeing a dime from what you do. Yeah. It's always been public domain since day one. So they stiffed him? Everyone has. That leaving off that copyright symbol has screwed that dude. I met George Romero. I have his. I did not know here that. Here in the corner of Hope, I, I have a, a laser disc autographed oh, yeah, on yeah, the dead yeah, laser disc. Uh, generous. Warm. You could meet a nicer guy. Has there ever been anybody who's actually given him stuff? Just. Uh, oh, but hasn't he? I mean, he's made other works. So. No, he has made other works. He's made, yeah, I mean, it's my not ma- like, my main, my it's main, not like he's hurt. My but main point still. here is this: with young filmmakers, if you're going to bitch about how you can't make a living making films anymore, because no one is buying the big films to put out in the theaters. It's, it's all video on demand or it's all limited release. So it's like, oh, you know what? I got to get a day job in between films. It's a huge thing, a huge bitching thing in the indie film world. Yeah. And then you're going to put fucking Night of Living Dead on a TV screen. Yeah. And basically rip off George Romero one more time where he doesn't see a dime. It's not paying tribute. Well, how do you know that they didn't pay him a dime? They didn't pay him a dime. Okay. Are you sure? Nobody does. And I say this as Halloween 2 did it. They had uh, uh, John Carpenter produced. They had Night of Living Dead on TV there. It's free. It's well known. You can show it. But don't you bitch about how nobody's making money in today's world with piracy and nobody's paying for movies. And then you're going to just cue up George Romero on there. Get you or your fucking friends and your cell phone camera and shoot... Two minutes of a chick running through the woods or whatever, and put that on your TV screen. I'm just saying, motherfucker should have put a copyright on his shit. He should have sued. He can't. He 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 can because there's no copyright. In 1968, if you did not have that, I'm not going to get into a big copyright law discussion. I don't know the semantics of it. (laughs) We're not copyright. But if you didn't have that fucking copyright symbol on the print of your film as it went out to drive-ins and everywhere across the United States. Any asshole could show it, not you pay know that you. That would be me. That would totally be you. No, that's one thing that it's kind of funny because even in our own works, our you know our our just freaking casual. Let's have fun and make shit. You know, you're always like, pay the people. Don't. I'm like, hey, or let's let's use this asset. I found it on Google, and you're like, fuck that, pay them. Well, everyone deserves to be paid. Yeah. Well, if you took I, a picture, I, you deserve to be paid. I understand if that. If you shot a frame of film and we're using it, you deserve to be paid. Well, let me let me ask you this, because this is always the thing that I get from it. How long is copyright supposed to last? That, yeah. Well, you can renew, you can renew and, and re-register copyrights. Again, I'm not, I'm just saying since the god, since the goddamn first time he put this movie out there, he has been robbed of. All profits. He hasn't made a dime off this goddamn movie because of that one little slip up. It's criminal. It's it's sad. Yeah. Especially when you have Walking Dead and all these 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 franchises based around what George Romero. Yeah, but created. at the yeah, but at the oh man, it, it's so don't make a horror movie and then openly but, rip off the true master of horror in your movie. But now you're getting into this weird area that like, all right, say he did copyright Nine of the Living Dead. All of a sudden, nobody can make a, a zombie movie after that. It's kind of like the asshole who copyrights Happy Birthday. Suddenly nobody can sing Happy Birthday I under, anymore. I, I, I understand that. I'm just saying whenever I see... I mean, Walking Dead indie, was not when, Night of the Living Dead. Whenever I see an indie horror film use Night of the Living Dead in their horror film because it's free... Oh, I, yeah. I mean, if you're going to go for the source material, you need to pay the source I material. I just see it as a big, yeah. hey, it's free... I can I can a little under- finger to a true master of horror, and I don't. What? I'm not saying that these guys, these Astron Six guys, 
bitch about yeah, the struggles yeah. of the modern filmmaker. I'm not. I'm not targeting them, and it's just a, a, a general. I can I can understand that, but it, it gets but, under my skin. But there's there's like a yeah. But can't someone? I mean, even now, I mean, couldn't someone? I mean, he could still pick it up and say he did create it. He could s- technically go back and so I'm sure there's a legal way to do it. Again, uh, again, and, I, but then after that, he would have to sit there, and it, it's just a matter of litigation. Yeah. Anytime someone show it, you slap him with the thing. Saying, "Hey, I don't show it again." I don't I'll again. I, I don't know. I just know this has been going on and on, dude. Night of Living Dead appears in more films. Yeah, I was about to say it. It kind of sucks, like in this scenario, when you're quoting the original source material and you're not paying for it. But at the same time, I'm also. It, it's kind of it's kind of weird because like the way the soft world, uh, the software patent com- uh, companies work. To where basically, like, you can draw a circle on a piece of paper and say, that's my disc wheel. Uh, therefore, everything that even remotely operates like an iPad, you know, can't... If it even remotely money. looks... Oh, it's a circle. That's just like ours. You can't do that. Yeah. Well, how many other shapes are there? Exactly. I guess... I guess I can't I do guess my touch square. Discussions weren't happening in 1968. No, no. The guy put all his company's money into making this book. He, he had an advertising company. Yeah. And they put all their money into making this money. Oh, wow. That sounds similar. Yeah. Oh, wait. No. It does. Maybe you could put some money into something. <laughs> all right. Well, that end of rant. Sorry. No, no, no. It, that, every time that, I see it pop up, I just kind of. That's a me. legitimate rant. But I again, mean, I'm not targeting. Use the actual I'm photos not, from I'm it. not targeting these guys. I'm just like, you know what? Don't be a dick and rip off George one more time. You've got filmmaking friends. Say, hey, go out with your cell phone camera and get two two minutes of footage of a chick running in the woods yeah. or something, and we'll show that. How do you know that they didn't reach out to Romero and say, look, we want to use this. Do you want something for it? Because and he's it like, wasn't ah, even it. a siege scene. It didn't even tie into the siege of the, the hospital we're in. It doesn't need to be. You guys are so familiar with that shit. The moment that you see Night of the Living Dead, you recognize it. I did, and I, I, I didn't appreciate it. Because, see, I did not. But I dusted it off my shoulder, and I moved on. No, you didn't. You just did. spent, like, the last ten no, minutes I, ranting. I said rant over. That means I'm done with it. Just wait five minutes. He'll be back on it. <laughs> Five minutes. I'm gonna do it right now. Here's what like this. I'd, no. I'd, I'd, I'd like talk to cigar, me. Talk man. to me about the cigar and the beer, man. Uh, I am still getting the tea sweetness. Uh, I've got the cedar going on, but it's not like a spicy cedar. It's the nice. I don't think woodsy. there is a such thing as a spicy cedar. Yeah, I, I think you're getting a little spice little off bit. the Mexican wrapper. But very subtle. The, very the, subtle. Very subtle spice. But man, that cedar and that cream and that tea. <coughs> man, I'm. I'm liking it, and the beer for me is becoming much more enjoyable since starting. Here's beer. what's interesting: is that I would, I would, I would order this at the pub. It wouldn't be a go-to beer for me. This pairing makes the beer actually pretty. I'm like, why wouldn't I order this all the time at a pub? Oh no, dude! I'm I my my enjoyment of the beer has skyrocketed since lighting the cigar. I would drink this beer for breakfast, Cody, beer guy. Beer thoughts? How do you like the beer? Are you getting the oatmeal? Right, dynamite get, drop in, Cody. Are you it get, is are you fantastic. Get, are, you getting the let me know. are you getting the oatmeal? You're, I'm just getting started, you know? <laughs> All right, let me start talking really quick. We're going to be blah, 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 blah. You, you got a big award tonight. You're still riding on it. Uh, no, no, no. I like, I like the beer. It is thick. I'm going to be honest about that. I mean, as he pointed out earlier, when you pour it, it's black. Motor oil black. Yeah. I mean, you look at Guinness. Guinness at least has a little bit of little light, bit coming, light through coming through. This this is as black dark blood as of the earth. black blood of the earth. And for for myself, I like it. I like the coffee. I like that bitterness. I mean, it's it's on point. Man, as an IPA guy, I love the bitterness. Uh, the, the coffee was too much, but man, that cigar is squelching it. It's putting a wet blanket on that beer. Just give me what I need from the beer. But, man. Uh, but I think maybe, you know, as you said, this is what the guy recommended to pair with it. So he knew 
maybe that you know anything else the cigar wasn't going to go it wasn't going to taste not, right you would not want to do this cigar with a with a don't do it with IPA a lager or a lager i actually think it's a really good pairing yeah yeah yeah, and I so. like the fact that it's just a freaking imperial stout. It's not like, oh, what you need to get is a twenty-one year age Dominican rum soaked in banana leaves. I drank that out in the car earlier, by the way. Oh, well. <laughs> huh? Gee, thanks for sharing. That's called Mad Dog Republic. That's called under my truck seat, waiting in the carpool <laughs> line at school booze. <laughs> I didn't say it out loud, did I? You did. You totally did. Well, just you guys heard me, right? Oh, God. Oh, God. Um, really good pairing. In that, it makes the beer, to me, better. And the beer really just is along for the ride with the cigar. Because the cigar has a lot going on by itself. So, let's come back to it here in a little bit. Um, well, James, the young guy that ran out of the farmhouse, is awake now and freaking out in his hospital bed. The elderly Dr. Powell injects him with a sedative, but he explains to Officer Carter that their resources are limited here since the fire, as everything has been packed up for their upcoming relocation. Yet, did you guys see any sign of a fire anywhere in this hospital? No. No. They're relocating the entire well, hospital. You know, they did show... Some well, plastics, right, some plastic you'll see this sheets. later. Excuse me. You'll see this Downstairs. later. Downstairs. No, 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 outside. no outside. 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 outside, outside. You'll see this later. Excuse me. Yeah. But yes, they do show when you see the outside of the building. You see like some plastic off yeah. on the side. But where like they plastic, are, you're like, right. It is like later. Plastic, it is like later. Covering the yeah, right. yeah. The like you know, just like know. plastic sheeting. Right. Right. Okay. Right. So I mean, but the, and of course, but, it was, that's, but that's later. It's not at this point. No, it's not. Because I'm looking around, like because they keep talking about this fire, and I'm like everything looks really fine here. Like yeah. They're mo- they're shutting down this ginormous. Oh, I mean, it'd be different if he said, you know, after that fire in the east wing, like you know, that's over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would have liked that line. Oh. Yeah. You should be writing scripts. Well, you know, they once again they did the best they could with the funds available. I understand. They left out the east wing. I understand. I would like that east <laughs> wing line. Um, we well, need to trim two seconds off this. The medical. The this will wing? explain everything. The east wing. No, get rid of it. The medical staff also discovers needle tracks on James's arm, which freaks out Carter, the cop. He fucking bled on me, and he runs out. He's got some blood on I, it. It spooks him. I think that's fine. Rant alert number two. Oh, God. Remember when there was a time when film characters could express themselves without dropping F-bombs every ten seconds? <sighs> what, what, what the fuck do you mean? Before Pulp Fiction? I'll tell you what I fucking mean. And you listen up too, fuckhead. Actually, it was before Reservoir. I can't... I can't fucking do this now. <laughs> I'm sorry. This cop cusses so much. Yeah. Yeah, he does. It's such a decorum breaker as a cop. Look, man. At, at your core, you're playing a police officer. Police officers don't... When they're interacting with this many members of the community... <sighs> Yeah, but drop f bombs. But so it's much. not like the. But it's well, not maybe like he's trying to is, channel like he's. I'm Officer McLean. But it, <laughs> fuck but it, this shit. Yippee motherfucker. No, but it's not like everything has like my goddamn pen leaked. <laughs> but it's not like Any goddamn he's, like, fucking coffee like, in this I place. tore my jacket. But it's not like he's like a professional among strangers. It's his ex-wife. It's her father. It's an elderly it's doctor and a grandpa there. He's dropping that bombs around everybody. Elderly doctor is his wife's father. I mean, it's not his wife's father, huh? Yeah, it is. No, it isn't. No. Yeah, it's his no. father-in-law. No. no. What? That's his father-in-law. Uh, you, you made that up. That's, no, I, I, it doesn't exist. I didn't. They never say that in the Dr. movie. Doctor Powell is the father-in-law. Never, never said that anywhere in the movie. I I know it's the father-in-law. Where did it? Where where, where did this happen? I'm. That's a huge like <laughs> thing you're saying that it doesn't. It it's not Let true. Me just get my <laughs> script. fake news. Fake news. Let me just get my script out over here and look <laughs> it through it. No, that it is. That's not true. No, it is. Is it? Listen, I heard it somewhere in there. Listen, Spicer. You can say shit. It doesn't make it true. <laughs> no, the, the, it's an elderly doctor who's not related to anybody there. Uh, he's related to the the chick. 
Which chick? The his ex wife. No. The cop's ex wife. Would you? I didn't. They I didn't. talk about losing the child. It's yes, because he was the doctor on staff. That were, dude, this is like derailing the the podcast. Dude, we like, did you're wrong, the, dude. The, he's not her father at all. It's, it's, we did see her. The his father. daughter died. It's his father. Oh God, this is gonna be. This has golden monkey written all over it. Golden oh. monkey. Drink more. Sing up. This will help get the train back on the rails. <laughs> a little hand rising. But up there's the an background. elderly guy with his pregnant young girl, and this cop is just dropping. If I was in a situation where you know there's elderly people here, and it's like the one cop there is like, "Fuck, you need to be a little bit professional." Fuck. I mean, you're already unshaven and have greasy long hipster hair. You can at least like not cuss every ten seconds. Well, yeah. John Carpenter made movies with heroes that didn't cuss. This is true. How many F-bombs did Tom Atkins drop in Halloween 3 or The Fog? None. All right, we can't all be John Carpenter. I'm just saying, there's, it just turns me off. It kind of well, does. you know... And, but, and did you guys know me. But as a podcaster on. and as a friend, nobody cusses more than me. Well, maybe me. Well, but you know, I think... I, it, dropped, I think it would have been... I much, cuss ad nauseum. I think it would have been much better if you... I'm they not offended by it. I just but, uh, but they I, didn't establish the character. Like when he when he's sitting because they you know he gets woken up. He's basically asleep in his patrol car, and he gets that call in, and he didn't just immediate. If he just like, what the fuck? What the fuck? I just, love you know, cussing. I love to cuss personally. But I, no, I agree with you. It's cathartic. I, but this character did not need to do that. He shouldn't have done that. He's an authority figure. He's a cop. It it, it pulled me out of it. I don't know. Agreed. Nah. I think, you know, if they had started off with that and then where he's in front of people, he's not doing it. But as quote unquote as shit hits the fan, he starts doing it again. I just I, I just but think I, mean, it's a, I think it's a poor choice as an actor or as a writer and as a director, you should be watching and be like, you know what, this is our one central authority figure. Like maybe he's, he's throwing around F bombs, but do you, but do you, he's I, whipping around his long but hair, I think which a maybe cop I wouldn't have. Let's make a character, a believable character out of here. This guy is he doesn't look like a cop. Now he's not talking like a cop. Let's try to make it. But are you? I think that real. might be that might I, be something towards the writers. I, Correct. No, 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 it all yeah. falls on the director. No, and that I goes agree. to my next point. Mix in with this cop's performance, the piss poor wooden local community theater acting of the nurse, the Asian nurse yeah. Kim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the old grandpa is horrible. It's not good. I don't care how cool your special effects are. Or how synthastic and eighties your soundtrack is. Well, uh, the, the, if you have wooden bullshit acting in that, all that money is wasted because all I see is well, bad their, their acting. Well, their money was spent uh, primarily dialogue. on their effects, and the two actors to whom I can take actually say that I, I get uh, your characters under control and get it done fast because I don't care what else you got going. For I you, didn't. It will crumble underneath you. Get your characters and your acting solid. That is your your core. Everything else can be substandard if that shit rocks. Yeah. If you lose your actors, if you have these piss poor performances, get that shit under control as a director, or else you're gonna lose everything else. I didn't mind. We said it with Devil's Candy. If you, you can't scare, if you don't care. True. I didn't, true. I think I all I saw when I saw this old grandpa and this Asian nurse, and to a certain extent, some cr- characters we're gonna be introduced to in a minute. Bad acting. Yeah. I, I agree. This man no longer cares. Get him a drink. I, I agree, especially. I don't care. Give me a drink. I, I, I wasn't that put off by the old man. Uh, the the Asian nurse, totally. I was just like, God, that's bad. That old man was pure local theater, man. The, the, the actual cop himself, I liked him in terms of acting and delivery. I do wish that they would have written him better, written his dialogue better, and told him to, you know, look like a fucking cop. Well, uh, but I thought that his actual delivery and performance wasn't bad. Well, and this isn't a this isn't jumping ahead. I was just, I'm gonna throw this out there. Several people make references to his dad was a cop, and he's trying to live up to his image. We never really go anywhere with that, right? But if you're if that's true that he's trying to, his dad was some amazing peacekeeper. Then I guarantee you he would have a mustache. He would shave a mustache, or shave. 
with the mustache. There would, or st- mustache. There would still be there would still be the mirrored shades, a, sh- a right shine there. on his badge, and the walkie-talkie on the sleeve. And visible, he might always. not lose his fucking shit and cuss every ten seconds when he's trying to calm other people or, down. But I think that's or he also would at least put on the facade that he's got control. Well, I think that I, once again, if we're going from that aspect, then yeah, he is a complete fuck up. I just don't he can't want to do anything. Right? I yeah, but that, that 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 plays into what it, the it does movie play is into it. Doing. I, I don't want us to see us get into a, an age of genre film, though. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> where <coughs> the hero cop is some swooped haired scruffy, yeah, hipster who can't handle shit and just kind of lucks his way into. Yeah, but at the same time, you have to call a spade a spade. I mean, if it's bad acting, let's fucking point it out. I mean, that's what we do. I see a lot of it in this movie, boys. Uh, what I thought would really remedy this movie and make this movie something special, I thought the acting, which that's on the directors. They let that performance get through yeah. the funnel. They let that performance get through the final edit. They didn't stop it. And it's one of my few criticisms of this. Um... Well, we join Carter and his ex Allison as he tries to scrub the kid's blood off his uniform uh, as she brings him a cup of coffee with his favorite mug, which she won in the divorce. Uh, she says can't, he can't get it back. The PD mug. Why would she have that? Why would she want that? In world's the best cop mug. You, yeah, the world's <laughs> best. If it's on a mug, it's got to be true. Dude, blown away taught us. You, you don't get those mugs just getting them. Why? Why would? The, why would she fight in the divorce for that mug? I really was just waiting for him to just make that reference. Like, you know, why did you have to take the ice trays? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what so kind of bitch what kind takes of the ice trays? Statistic bitch. But I will say this: I like the actress. I th- oh no, I, I have no was, problems with Allison. I she, and she obviously, was one of the this small- movie is saved by every time there's a piss poor performance, there's a real actor to swoop in and actually do the job. And Allison is there more than not to do that job. She's great. I agree. Uh, of course, I didn't make a note of her name or any of her previous, uh, <laughs> but she's really good. The ex-wife. Uh, you really get the sense that she's doing her best to play nice with her ex. You know, he's awkward and it's kind of fresh, but she's really trying to be nice and kind of coexist in this intense I didn't situation. Think it was coexist. I thought she was trying to get back together. She was very kind of well. You know, he did. I mean, he did make that reference in there where he's like, you know, where they're talking about the money. Why he's are like, you, you trying know, to be nice? He's like, you're you're being nice. Yeah, like. They had a bad divorce, and and she's being nice. And now and all of a sudden, here she comes again. Yeah, and she's like, I missed you, and it's like, hey, you know what? These are actually real emotions that are. I believed all this because of her. I actually, yeah, I, I I thought the interplay between the two of them. I would have liked to see him go, "Fuck you," you know, "You broke my heart." Well, yeah. we'd learn later why that happened. Happen. Why happen. happened? Uh, well, she leaves, and Doc Powell steps in the old doctor to tell Carter that it'll be a while before James will be in any condition to talk. He's, he's sedated. He also advises Carter to go easy on his ex-wife, Allison. Because that's his she's, daughter? She's still... No. That, no. Tut, drop that. It, it's not her daughter at all. That <laughs> never is said. Uh, I watched this movie three times. That's not, Trust me, that doesn't exist. Uh, she's still emotionally dealing with with losing their child during labor at that very hospital and she need, he, he needs to be sensitive to that so now we've gotten a little bit insight on the divorce they lost a child during labor there and that is going to come into play a, a lot later uh, and no wonder he didn't want to come back to this hospital because he was begging that dispatch like any other hospitals, like anything, his just ex-wife anything. works there, and can that's you call where his ahead daughter and died. like. Well, there's no, another no, hospital no. four like, counties take, over. Perfect, that's the one. Can you call ahead and have my ex-wife take a coffee break, please? Just, I do not want to see her. Um, yeah, so uh, it makes perfect sense why he didn't want to go through it. Um, also, Doctor Powell says that he went through a similar situation when he lost his daughter Sarah. Uh, he was a total mess afterwards. That was Allison's sister. No, it wasn't. Oh, you gotta stop. You're really derailing. <laughs> fake news. Fake news. <laughs> uh, and it, it's a mess when you lose your child, but it takes time, and you'll get you'll you'll get through it. Well, Officer Carter uh, roams the hallways uh, after this, 
of the hospital where he comes across the sound of a woman whimpering from one of the patient rooms. Uh, remember that young dude that Nurse Kim was reading the textbooks to? Yeah. Well, Nurse Beverly is hovering over him now, digging a pair of surgical scissors deep into his eye sockets. Like, digging. Yeah. He's dead. Killing his ass. Uh, she turns around to face uh, Carter, telling him, This isn't my face. What you're seeing, it's, it's not my face. She has peeled all the skin off her face. Very reminiscent of John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. And indeed, it appears all the skin has been stripped from her face, leaving only exposed bright red tissue. She makes a move with the scissors towards Carter, and he reluctantly, it happens so fast, he pulls his gun and just shoots her right in the head. That's why you should always carry a gun. The me- We're not going to get into that, Tuck. We don't have enough time for this tonight. <laughs> We're not... We cannot do this. <laughs> okay. And he actually did what you wanted him to do. He shot her. Yeah, he shot her. Uh, the medical staff rushes in the room, and Carter bolts to the restroom, kind of dizzy because he just killed Beverly, his friend, assumingly, and he just blows chunks in the sink. Cody style. Hey, we've all done it. <laughs> Let's not, not say we haven't. Of it. It's hard to get the chunks down the drain. Let's but not say we haven't. We've all done it. We've all done it. Anyone uh, who says they haven't done it, liar. Well, while he's in the bathroom, we see our first glimpses of another world. He kind of blacks out. Some swirling clouds. Giant, dark, odd pattern swirling clouds shaped like triangles. Endless, rocky terrain. Close-ups of bright red tissue, like human tissue, contracting and being ripped apart. We also see an astral kind of figure up in the stars. Yeah. Uh, Dark, starry night, kind of this astral figure kind of floating by. Very weird, wacky stuff uh, that Agent Carter or Officer Carter is seeing in his in his passed out moment. Uh, all of a sudden, Carter pops up from the floor. He had passed out, and Allison and the doctor are helping him up. Uh, they think he had a seizure, but he's not having any of that. He's ready to keep going. Uh, and all of a sudden, they tell him that a state police officer, Mitchell, has shown up. You this know, this is what he, I was really liking. You know you're in trouble when you wake up and the state trooper's already there. <laughs> uh, he makes it clear. This guy's a no-nonsense dude. Carter, give me your pistol. There's a shooting. I need to take your gun. And this one I, I have to jump in on. I know him from one place. I didn't I didn't be him. I just knew him from one place. Where did you know him from? Art Hindle. Is his name. Okay. And one of my favoritist movie series, movies, Porky's. Oh, he's the sheriff. He's the sheriff. Oh, dude, good call. I love, as soon as I saw him, I was like, oh my God. I knew him (laughs) as the doctor in the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers with Donald Sutherland. He also did a lot of things. He was in, uh, he did a lot of 80s uh, TV, Airwolf. Uh, well, he did, Scarecrow uh, and Mrs. King. He did Cronenberg's The Brood, uh, the can- Canadian horror right, film. Right. He's the father, I think. But yes. Dude, he's the Porky Sheriff. Yes. That punches out the motorcycle racist dad. Yeah. Uh, good call, man. As soon as I saw him, I was like, oh my God, it's him. Well, he confiscates Carter's pistol and he says, you know what? I'm in charge now. Uh, he came to pick up James because they found a bloodbath about 20 miles away. Lots of dead bodies, lots of blood, and he thinks James is responsible. That's uh, the dude who ran out of the house. Yes. The druggie. The druggie who's now cha- handcuffed in the, in the hospital room. He also looks at Carter and tells him, you know what? Your dead cop dad wouldn't be pleased either with the shit show I'm looking at. It's kind of harsh, right? It's very harsh. Well, it's extremely it, over the it does, top. Harsh. It does accentuate that everybody knows everybody. But God, at the man. same time, I mean. But once again, it's like, oh, you just killed one of your old friends. Your dad would be very disappointed in you. He would. He would. <laughs> but yeah, come on. I mean, he. You know, and it would have been one of those things that he'd been like, you know, let's go look. Let's go look at her. Well, you tell me what you would have done. Carter asks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, have you seen her fucking face? 
look in the Tuttle rule of how to do things. I shot her in the face. She was weird, and I shot her. That's what Tuttle says to do in a situation like this. Strange chick with no face coming at you with a well, scalpel? Well, shoot her. Well, Carter asked, like, hey, can I at least call it in? It was my kill. Can I call it in? He's like, sure, do that. So he, he tries to get a, f- a phone line out of the hospital, and it's all busy signals. Why so, didn't he do his walkie-talkies? And, but, and there's a little subtle thing in here that I did love. As he's walking through the hospital trying to get to a phone, you start to hear it in the background. It's a little, a little static. Yeah, rah, the radios goes because they were listening rah, to country music oh, yeah. on and the radios just, and everything and goes static. Is, is it, but you think you think it's the music, you think it's the soundtrack, and it's leading to something. But no, no, he gets up to the phone and there's a radio right there, and he's like, and he, and he, he turns the it static. Off. That is one of several times in this movie I've been confused on what is actually supposed to be heard by the characters and what is sound design. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Because there's a lot of stuff I'm like, oh, that's the music. That's the soundtrack. No, no, no. That's actually what they were hearing. What the characters were hearing. It confused me a little bit. Good point, though, with the radio. But he cannot get a signal. So he's like, you know what? He radios Mitchell. He's like, on his thing. He's like, I'm going to go out to the car and phone us in from the cruiser. Well, the Why car- can't... I'm sorry. Those CBs are tied into the phone, the cruiser. Why can't he just phone it in from his shoulder mounted CB. Well, the car radio isn't working either, but our hero has bigger problems as he hits the lights and he sees a figure dressed in a white robe and a, and a white hood standing stoically off in the distance in front of with his a, cruiser. With a black triangle. It's a clan face. robe with it's a, a clan triangle. robe with a black triangle over the eyes of the hood. Uh, but much more crisp and starched than the clan. Clans were always kind of clumsy and Kind of the hood would kind of lean over. This was very uniform. It was Tut's like no? I think the clan presented them presented themselves uh, very <laughs> professionally. And, uh, I'm well, just saying they had wives and they ironed their sheets. Well, uh, Carter, being Carter, yells, "What the fuck what are you doing? doing? What are you doing, man?" Because that's what he you, is now true to character. As a cop, that's what you would do. What the fuck are you doing? <sighs> No, a cop would say, excuse me. Sir, please step take over your to the hood off. S- excuse please take your hood off. No, step over to the a thing. A cop would unbolt. Un- he doesn't bolt. have a gun. Oh, uh, there's, there's, there's a, a gun shotgun in the car. Oh, there's there's a your- shotgun in the car. The well, dude would have gone. He's in his cruiser. If he was, he if he was awesome there. McLean cop, he would have reached under his chair and pulled out that extra 9 millimeter, <laughs> Or, stuck gone, it back in his or gone to the truck, well, got his shotgun, and say, sir, can you step over here? Well, being hipster cop, uh, Aaron's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> to which, I love this. The electricity immediately goes out in the parking lot and in the hospital. And you hear some sort of like... Horn in the yes, distance. A, a horn, which I thought was sound design. I thought that was the soundtrack I'm hearing. We'll learn later that horn is actually a real horn that's sounding, but we don't know that now. All of a sudden, uh, the figure charges at him, pinning him down the ground. He digs a large Rambo knife into his chest. Uh, I love the physicality of the figure in the robe. Yeah. The way he marched, or she, whoever... Just that it was. It reminded me of the original Halloween, how John Carpenter told the shape to move, very mechanical, but it wasn't like he ran. It was just a really cool, scary, yeah, uh, pouncing motion. A, a, it gets uh, a movement thumb. with purpose. Movement with purpose. Intent. An intent. Good job, boys. Uh, as Car- Carter finally kicks him off of him, the, the knife's digging. Yeah, he had already. I mean, it, he had stabbed him at least a good like couple two couple inches. inches into his chest. He kicks him off of him. Uh, he looks up and he sees there's at least a dozen other more robe figures standing around, and he races back inside the hospital. Should have gotten that shotgun. Should have gotten in his car and just started driving around. Well, uh, him down. Speaking of back inside, we cut to the uh, room inside. Remember Nurse Beverly, the one that uh, face was gone and was doing. Her face has now completely been removed, and we see tentacles. Very thing, shoot, thing-esque. shoot, thing, Very thing-esque. John Carpenter's the thing ask. They're just, just, like, it's like one of those, was that little like that yard thing with the little water spouts. Those things are just waving everywhere, yes. <laughs> shooting out of her fucking face. Cthulhu. Uh, 
Well, no, this is all very Lovecraft, the old, yeah. one, the ancient ones. Yeah. Um, uh, and we cut to that, and then we immediately uh, jump back in. Well, Carter has more trippy, otherworldly hallucinations as he lies unconscious on the ER floor. Uh, Dr. Pell tells Allison, you know, he's been stabbed in the chest. Uh, Dr. Pell tells Allison he's lost a lot of blood, but just like that, blood everywhere. Carter rises to his feet and all of a sudden he's good again. Like, good. let's go. I got this. Uh, oh, they, I'm sorry. That knife that was just like two inches <laughs> deep in your chest. Oh, that's cool. I'm okay. It's I cool. swear. I, I'm okay. It's just, well, I mean, I'm sure if he like stitched him up, he gave him like some painkillers and whatnot. Local. He's not feeling it yet. Uh, he's not feeling it. So uh, they hear a commotion coming from James's room. So Mitchell and Carter go to investigate. Uh, in the room, James is screaming for help. He's handcuffed to the bed, as we know. And behind him, what was once Nurse Bev is now a giant hideous creature with slithering tentacles covered in slime. Uh, she's roaring in a beastly guttural kind of roar. Uh, just a huge mon- fucking monster. Uh, Mitchell fires some useless bullets from his pistol at Bev as Carter uh, kicks the bed rail loose to cut, get James out of there. Uh, they quickly slam the door shut on the Bev monster and they race out to the lobby. It's good. The door's closed. They don't try to lock it or <laughs> even shove like a gurney in front of it. They're, all right, she's the in door's there. closed. It's no, good. It's in there. They, ra- they, they race back out to the ER uh, where Carter quickly smashes his elbow into the emergency glass to get his hands on a Fire axe. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's what the doctor said. Yeah, whoa, hey. <laughs> did you see what... You didn't see what I saw. Uh, he tells Mitchell, we're going to go get those cars now. We're getting out of here. Uh, robe figures or not, anything's better than being in here with that, that fucking thing. But before they can do anything, the father and the son, remember them from the opening scene? They burst into the ER, guns first, and immediately set their sights on James. They want him dead. The little guy from the opening scene. Uh, so he grabs Maggie, the pregnant girl, and holds a scalpel to her neck uh, as a human shield. Very intense Mexican standoff here. Everybody's saying, don't shoot, don't shoot. What the fuck? Nobody knows who these guys are, what's going on. Dr. Powell gets in the middle of it, tries to calm down James. Nobody's going to hurt you. Just give over the scalpel. All of a sudden, he jams that fucking scalpel right into Dr. Powell's jugular vein. Arterial spray all over the place. He drops dead. Yeah, boy, did I use that term right? Arterial spray? He did indeed. Well, old Grandpa Ben, remember him? Maggie's grandpa? He's had enough. Nobody's watching him. He just clocks out James and punches him, knocks, knocks his ass out. Suddenly, the nurse Bev monster, who's growing astronomically, uh, opens the ER doors, and her tentacles come out and grab State Patrolman Mitchell and drag him back with her. Carter chases after it, but it throws him aside as it digs its... It's got these real spiky arms that comes out of its body and goes right into Mitchell's eye holes and, like, a scalp. Uh, very creepy. And it also seemingly grows another brain out of the top of its head. Yeah. Like, the top of its head grows out, and this huge brain grows out. Uh, the lights are flashing constantly, the fluorescent lights. So it's hard to get a real glimpse of what's happening. Yeah. But it's bad, and it's creepy, and it's and it's, it's real. It's not CGI. It's not oh, no, yeah, it's bullshit. Very, it's, it's all practical. And that was my only complaint with a lot of the scenes going forward after the this. lighting. The lighting. Yeah. A, a lot of it is, is done so dark. You know, because John Carpenter always liked to show his 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 creature work off. Well, now, why would it, I wouldn't even say that. I wouldn't mind it having been being dark, but I just didn't like the fact that they're doing like these, like these loose lights and they're swinging and it's creating this it's strobe hard, effect. It's hard to see what's going on. And you're, I was like, it, I would rather it just have been like a low light with like a, you know, a, just because they kept trying to like it go was back a, and forth in this it, scene. It was between a, these characters. It, it was a definite choice to show minimal amounts of this creature, but it was frustrating as a viewer. You know, just show me the goddamn thing. Show show me what we're dealing with here, especially when you're not 
well, faking it. You've uh, created this creature. Yeah. There, there, there's two. There's two worlds at play here. One, you're trying to minimize the visibility of your prosthetics, but you're also trying to create chaos with your lighting. And I think they went a little bit overboard. They're like, it's a hectic scene. Everybody's like, what the fuck? So let's do some lighting choices that kind of mimic what the fuck. That's where your swinging lights come in. That's where your strobe effects come in. To where it kind of disorients the viewer to where we don't know what's going on. I think they just went a little bit too overboard. I I, I agree. Uh, (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, the father and the son then come around the corner and proceed to bludgeon the monster over and over again with fire axes. Yeah, because the the <coughs> pistol bullets to it do nothing. Work. So let's give it some fire. So axes. we just see blood flying everywhere. Uh, whenever they hit it, there's big globs of white pus shooting out of its body. Uh, you know, they just wound after wound. They just create till eventually it collapses. Uh, by the time the nurse bed monster's dead, it's just a big fucking mess. Like, yeah, horrible mess. It's a good thing they're moving out of this facility. Can you imagine they try to stay there? <laughs> uh, back out in the yard. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love that creature. I wish that the lighting situation had been handled differently, to where we would have seen it more cleanly. But when I think that would have, you know, in in most instances, you always do. Because, like, you know, when you first see it in the hospital room, it's dark. It's in the corner. That's okay. This was an opportunity to bring it out into the light. You spent so much time making this this real creature. I I really think. See what you got. I really really think that it was the aesthetics. All the creatures in the thing, John Carmen's thing, you saw... At some point, you know, he works into in, it, and all of a sudden, you see in it. total see, light. I, I think I think that they actually did play a little bit too much into it's chaotic. Let's do some lighting choices to emphasize the chaos because later on in the movie, they don't shy away from showing you. No, the they creatures. don't. But 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 here and later, I went in this movie hearing so much of even the doctor when I said we were doing this movie. He's like, I'll be curious what you said. I heard it was very John Carpenter esque. I heard there's a lot of Carpenter. This movie is shot nothing like a John Carpenter movie. It's the, scored nothing like a John Carpenter movie. It's, some, it's not scored. There, there are some there shots are visual, that are. There are visual. There's the, there's the montage of the the lone hallway, the outside of the hospital. Those things are so minimal. Yeah, but that's still, this movie. I mean, that's like a this that's movie a Carpenter is shot, staple. This movie as a whole is shot nothing like a John Carpenter film. It's well, scored think, nothing like a John. Well, Carpenter I think, but film. I, like I said, there's they said there's hints. Like but there's obviously hints. Obviously, the, the the beginning it's, scene. Everybody's where we see, in. Influenced by things, you can't help but be influenced by things. I don't see this as a as a John Carpenter jerk off session at all. No, it, no, it's not. I think but, there, there's many hints, but you through, can't say that through but, many movies. Yeah, but the you know, you, and you mentioned it earlier that this is a is more Lovecraftian. Yeah, it's more in the mouth of madness right. than any other. But at the, but at the same Carpenter time, film. I mean, you can't you can't say that it's not Carpenter influenced because. The influences are visible. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, when, no, when, no. It, when it sees the long, lonely hallway, it cuts to the outside yes. of the hospital. Those are those are quintessential carpenter no, no, montages. No, no, those those tiny moments are, but their use of of a frenetic camera, a, a fast paced right, shaky right, camera. Right, right, right. Their use of these streaking lights to to downplay. Yeah, yeah that's not carpenter this, at all. Yeah. Th- these these monumental creature scenes are shot nothing like carpenter yeah. would do. So you know, I I think these. These people, they're like, you know, this is a, a John Carpenter. Uh, no, it's not. No, no. There are visual. No, the guests did, the did it way better. There are visual tips of the hat right. to the creatures created in the thing and in the mouth of madness. Yeah, but but these guys say, are filming it from a completely, yeah, an yeah. aesthetic much different than Carpenter. Cinem- cinematography wise, aside from the the environmental montage. Yeah, it's totally not not Carpenter, but there's still some Carpenter which own, I like undertones because, like, even with Nurse Betty or whatever Beverly. her name is, you know, there are still times to where you're 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 seeing the thing, you're seeing the thing. Well, we're seeing the thing uh, with the tentacles, right? Yeah, right. You're seeing Prince of Darkness in the, the stripped off face, right? I mean, there's there's definitely but some we're nods, not, but there. they're not shooting them like the thing. No, 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 no. no, no. no. This movie is up. not an homage so to Carpenter. It's not. It's really not. They're, I think it's an homage to a lot of different horror movies. Oh, it is. I mean, you've got 
I'm going to get into that later. We'll, let's let's keep moving. Uh, back out in the ER, the father is ready to burn the fucking place down and kill everyone. All right, I'm going to go ahead before we even get to there. I hate the father. This guy is such a one trick pony. Is TNCC just... anti father? I dislike him, but he's I mean, not a let's good face actor. It, after you see what's going on, uh, he pretty much knows how to deal with this shit. No, 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 he doesn't. And no, I'll get, no, I'll get no, into no, this no, later. No, no, I'm going to get into it right here in one minute. Give me one minute. Uh, First of all, he's a bad. I'm sorry. He his performance in this movie was bad. As Carter begs, like I said, the father's ready to wipe everybody out. The son kind of they 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 pressure the son like please talk some sense into the father, and he's like he can't talk. Show him, and the son pulls down his shirt to reveal his throat's been pulled out. He's got a big band. And he can't. He's not talking to anybody. He's a mute. Uh, I kind of like the son. It's only after Allison <laughs> Carter's ex-wife convinces the father that they know absolutely nothing about what's going on here. They're just innocent hospital workers that he kind of lets off the gas a little bit. Uh, At this point, I can't tell if the father is just another lousy actor in this thing to join the grandpa, the Asian chick, or maybe he's a decent actor who's just made some horrible character choices and the directors went for it. Yeah. It's the downfall of this movie, man. Bad acting. I, th- I think so, man. If you had I good just... acting, if you had Drunk Dad as that as as that character, Drunk Dad would have nailed it. Nailed it. Well, you had two known working actors, Art Hindle and the Doctor. Uh, which which if if you blew you all your money on that Doctor, money well spent. He's great. Yeah, yeah. But my God, man, you can find actors. And spend some time with them as a director and get them not to suck. I think they were... Take pro- 10 minutes away from well, your prosthetics you know, and, here, and, here, and you're 10 minutes away from your, your but creatures. everything and, in the film... And make these guys is, good actors. At, well, excuse me. As far as, I, as, far as I, I have learned thus far, I mean, every actor is Canadian. Oh, they're all... Yeah, they're all Canadian. So... They purposely went out to find Canadian actors. But well, well, that's all they. Th- I mean, here, it's an my, Ontario production. My, here, they're, they're they're all using local talent. But here's the thing, I will give the father this. I, I, unlike the grandpa and unlike the nurse, I couldn't decide if he's a bad actor or if he just made choices that were bad, and the directors let him get away with it because they weren't they were concentrating around other stuff. I think I, I think that's the case. I, I no I well, I think it was a mix of bad acting, bad choices, and bad writing. Uh, I I can't get I I won't get into it right now. The dude was just so over the top of I know everything that's going on. I know what's going on. I'm gonna I'm which gonna, will which I'm will learn solve this which, problem which will learn right he, now. Which will learn he actually doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything. Anything. He, I mean, he's wanting to kill the the junkie. But how many guys do we know like that here in Central Texas? I know everything about everything. He, they don't know anything. It may it may no that sense. is a, that is it a choice. No, no, it didn't. This make dude sense. is ready to wipe out it's a, a choice. hospital. It's a choice. This guy's ready to wipe out a hospital because he's. Authoritarian, he knows that what's going on, and then when you find out that he doesn't, you're kind of like, "What the fuck? This yeah. this makes no sense no, at it, all." It didn't work for me. Uh, real quick, you just finished your cigar. Oh, yeah, 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 I did. Fan, big thumbs up. I'm gonna say that that's my favorite cigar that we've done this year. Cody, you're halfway through. Yeah, you're a slow smoker. What are you feeling? It's been good, <laughs> but but since I've been now about halfway, I haven't really felt like I've had much transition. I don't. I have had the the cedar, the tea, the cream. There's not a lot of transition to it. Fairly and that's not, steady. And that's, not a, that's not necessarily it's a bad not, thing. It, no, it's not a slam. I, I I have got in this last third, as you can see, it, the burn line has remained ridiculously sick. I mean, straight yeah, across. Straight on. Uh, the draw has been great. Construction, top notch. Uh, I'm getting in this last third a little bit of chocolate. Um, with that spice and that cedar and that tea, 
I mean, I will say, like, right now, I mean, this thing is n- almost to my palate is, is just pure chocolate. Really? So you're getting the chocolate, too? Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. See, I missed out on the chocolate. Yeah. Well, you smoke too fast. You smoke slow. Uh-huh. It's just, I mean, and, and to me, that's phenomenal. I like it. Yeah. But like I said, it hasn't, tra- I mean, it's been slow. It's just, it hasn't transitioned. I mean, right now it's chocolate, but I was getting chocolate earlier, but now it's all chocolate. Okay. See, that's what's funny. I, is I've that run the gamut I, of tea, cream, cedar, chocolate. Um, I, I, I didn't taste any. Cream. See, that's what's funny is that I know you guys like the transition. To me, I I don't demand transition in a cigar. If you can hit my palate note and stay constant, I'm cool with that. And this cigar did that. Well, here's what I think is cool. Uh, the pairing is working beautifully. Um, this cigar is, like I said, released in August, ideally, for a limited run. Until they sell out. Yeah. The beer is a limited run, October to January. Really? Okay. So you buy the cigar in August, you let it sit for a little bit in your humidor. Then October when this beer comes up, they kind of coincide. It's a it's a good it's a good mix that way. Yeah. Um you're done, so I'm gonna bring up MSRP. Uh when these come up in August, what do you want to pay for this thing? Nine bucks. I want to pay. I'm going, se- on, I'm going on two hours almost with the robot. I want to pay seven dollars for every cigar I ever smoked. I know, but but you loved it. You said you loved it. Best cigar you smoked all but year. But it had a shaggy foot. That's what it's called, right? A shaggy foot. Yeah, no, good, 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 good. Would you say? I nine bucks. Nine bucks. I'd love to pay eleven. I swear to God, if he goes nine oh one, I'd probably <laughs> play. Uh, what would you pay and be like, this is a good price for this? Twelve fifty. Twelve fifty, eleven bucks. No. This is my favorite part. When these come up in August, you wanna know what the price is on these things? Uh-uh. Five fifty. What the fuck? Alright. I might have to get some more. Five fifty. Five fifty. For I, this, I had to clarify that with wrist day. Are you, really five fifty? Are you shitting me? Five fifty. Best cigar you smoked this year is five. Is that five fifty? Maybe in another currency, Macedonian <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cougarans or whatever they, whatever they. <laughs> Holy shit, man! Oh, it's twenty eight dollars. I'm so sorry. Twenty I, uh, sheep casings. Uh, I don't know what they. Because uh, I still think that uh, pound for pound, the Olivia, uh, the Kane F five fifty, which is usually anywhere between yeah, but you said, five you said seventy that to, they have, but they're still. I mean, even if you're paying like you know in Austin, you're well, paying around the, the six the, bucks. The temperance line is always around seven bucks. Dude, five fifty for one of these bad boys. Yeah. That Stay is, tuned. That's nice. Stay uh, follow Risty on Facebook. When these guys go up on sale on Facebook in uh, August, in August, five fifty. Five dollars. Shoot me a text when that happens. Five dollars and fifty cents. Shoot me a text because I won't remember any of this. In I the don't morning. know if it's uh, my favorite cigar of the year so far, but it's definitely the best deal of the year so far. Oh fuck yeah, dude! Five fifty. Come on. I thought you'd shit over that. It's got a bunch of Lyotian boys rolling this up, and I mean, come on, we get the price. Can we get down. through one podcast without bringing up oiled up Laotian boys. <laughs> I don't know. Ask Cody. Why would I know anything <laughs> about that? I mean, well, Maggie, remember the pregnant Maggie? I'm going to move on from Laotian boys. Uh, or as the father has affectionately nicknamed her, the teenage slut. They're like, "Hey, we got to stop. We got to go out there and stop these robe figures." Like, who's gonna do it? Grandpa or that teenage slut? You don't know her. Hey, he's hardcore. I, he, he's already like punched a bunch of people out. He's, he's, That's what I'm saying. He's so over the fucking top, male aggressive. Well, uh, male dominant monkey motherfucker. Maggie is having contractions now, so Allison wants to go down to the pharmacy and get some much needed drugs to help her out. Carter makes her swear to wait for him. He knows that she's extra motivated to help Maggie because they lost their own baby. Yep. 
but he insists she wait until he, the father, and the son go out to get his shotgun out. They're going to need more bullets to get through the night. And they let's go out. We're going to go out to my patrol car and get my shotgun. Wait hmm. for me. Promise me you'll wait for me. As soon as Carter leaves through leaves to get his gun, Allison breaks her promise and goes straight to the pharmacy. I'm guessing that's why he divorced her. She's a promise breaking. Come on, tramp, right? Oh, you vow breaking hoe. She promised him two minutes ago, and now she's already marching back there. Till death do us part. Oh wait. Well, as she goes to the pharmacy and starts grabbing the meds she needs to deliver Maggie's baby off the shelf. We rack focus to see the deceased, supposedly Dr. Powell, standing behind her in the shadows. While the men are outside trying to get the shotgun, he has a ridiculously hard time getting the shotgun well, first of all, out of his cruiser. First of all, it's... It has moved. It's it not, has moved. It's not as close to where he parked to the hospital. It has moved out. And I don't understand this at all. The loud horn. The robed figures have pushed the car away. Well, that loud horn sounds again. First time it played, I thought it was part of the sound design. I didn't think they, the characters could hear it. I thought it was part of the soundtrack of the movie. But the father tells us that horn is actually bringing these robed figures from miles away to congregate here. Because every time you see these robed figures, there's more of them. There's more of them, yeah. So that's actually uh, something that's playing in the movie, this horn. Not sound design. That, I got confused there. Uh, the rogue figures attack once again. Uh, just as Carter finally gets his shotgun free. As one of the figures tries to stab the father, Carter finally gets shotgun and shoots one of the rogue figures, blasts his ass. I just don't understand the whole moving of the car. Because... They wanted to get, it, they wanted to get away to make the scene. Okay. So is the car moving or the hospital? Well, they run their way. The <laughs> hospital. <laughs> Well, they run the three guys, uh, the father, the son, and Carter, ro- run back I'm into sorry, the I just keep waiting for you to say the Holy Ghost. I know. I'm going to say it at one point. <laughs> it was so hard for me as I was typing this up. Just the father, the son, and Carter. <laughs> Wait, well, is Car- Carter the Holy Ghost? Well, Carter... I'm so confused. I'm terrible. Is that what he's supposed to be? So much referencing to other material. Carter and the father then go looking for Allison. Uh, because she broke her promise and went off on her own, but she's nowhere to be found. On their way back to the ER with the the bag full of meds, they did find the bag full of meds that she got for Maggie. Uh, they hear a phone ringing because remember the phones are dead. They hear a phone ringing from Doctor Powell's office. The call is coming from the morgue. It shows up the morgue in a very crit. So Daniel picks up the phone. I'm out. I'm out. I'm in. Phone call from the morgue. Oh, of course. You don't answer that. Of course. (laughs) Well, Daniel answers it in a very crisp, cold voice we hear. Hello, Daniel. It's the doctor's voice. Not not our doctor. Dr. Powell. That would be crazy if it was our doctor. (laughs) doctor. We haven't seen him in a while. Like, what's he Uh, doing there? All right. First of all, phone call from the morgue. Oh, wait. It's a dead guy on the other line. I'm out. We saw blood spraying out of his neck. They covered him in a sheet, for God's sakes. That means he's dead. By the law, I got to inform you, by the laws of movie making, (laughs) if you put a white sheet over a man, he's dead. When you're dealing with the occult, uh, the white sheet... It's just a temporary boundary. Here's what Dog Pal says. In a very calm, clear voice. He has a great voice. They, oh, he they, does. they did cast a great voice actor. Yes. Daniel, you saw something when you woke up earlier. What was it? I can show you more of it if you like. I'm sure it's hard for you to understand. It was hard for Beverly as well, but I assure you my intentions are altruistic. Remember that night when you brought in Allison, the child inside of her clawing to get out? Losing my daughter changed me, but I'm doing what I have to do to make it right. You'll understand soon enough. After Pal then also throws in some shots about Carter's dead cop dad. Everybody keeps bringing up this dad. I don't know where that's going. <laughs> they, they never go anywhere with it, like how he died or what. They're just like, 
I know you're trying Your to... father would be disappointed in you. I, it's not drunk dad, it's cop dad. It's cop dad, but I, I know you're trying your best to be your dad, but you, you're not doing it. You suck. <laughs> you're not You're not good. Son. Okay, I get it. I suck. <laughs> Stop bringing it up. Well, Dan, well, Daniel asks... Let me live my life. Daniel demands to know where his ex-wife Allison is, to which the doctor says, Don't worry, Daniel. I'm going to help her. I'm going to help all of you. While Carter's on the phone with the doctor, the father is digging through the doctor's desk. He finds all these Polaroids of people in white robes with triangle faces, uh, sacrifice, dead bodies piled up, uh, the black triangle Mm -hmm. painted on various things. Uh, The doctor took a lot of Polaroids of, of stuff, apparently. And just leaves them in his desk. No, they're a little metal box. He, that he, oh, he leaves unlocked. That he leaves unlocked on his desk. Well, Carter uh, gives Grandpa Ben a pistol. Hope you know how to work this. You're on your own. And he prepares to head down to the basement to rescue Allison. The army of rogue figures has grown outside. There's like 50 of these guys outside now. Uh, at one point, uh, somebody says... You know they're trying to get in here, and I think it's the father who says no, no, no. They're there to keep Keeping us from us getting out. Yeah. Uh, but first, uh, Carter, the father and the son and the Holy Ghost interrogate ah. James. They're like, I don't know what's going on, the fuck's going on here, but I know somebody who might. So they get James, the little meth head, and they hold on with the help of a ball peen hammer see just how much he knows uh yak boy ball peen hammer is that right ball peen actually it is a claw hammer a claw claw hammer hammer. what's a ball peen hammer ball peen hammer is for working metal claw hammer obviously for it has the it's big claw on the back for pulling nails a big claw ball peen has your normal hammer in but on the back is a rounded for actually hammering metal okay i'm just saying that with the father who apparently is eradicating anybody associated with this evil because like he knows what the fuck's going on like this evil is spreading so he's got to eradicate anybody who has a touch on this thing all of a sudden he doesn't know what's going on I mean he was about to kill the junkie dude I thought was to keep something from spreading he is so dead set against killing this guy but I think it's because he thinks that he killed all these people. He thinks he the bloodlust is on his hands. He's misguided there. I don't know. That's why he shot the girl, and he thought right. he thought these meth heads were behind this whole, behind this whole slaughter. Yeah. Okay, that makes a little more sense. I think so. Um, well, in fear of getting his fingers smashed up against, you know, they're threatening to break all his fingers. James tells him that the doctor's behind it all. To, which, say to which the sheriff's like, or Carter's like, we already know that. Tell yeah. us something we don't know. I will say that this scene works on a lot of different levels. You got the mute boy who's, you know, he's into it. Like, I'm gonna smash the fuck out of this dude's hand. I like the I like the son, uh, the actor who plays the son who doesn't mute, have any speaking roles. Mute, I actually mute Matt Damon. I actually, <laughs> I actually like mute Matt Damon. He to me he was interesting. I wish Matt Damon was mute in more of his movies. Uh, Easy. Matt Damon is a national treasure. He's something. National treasure. Uh, treasure. Burden. Burden. <laughs> <laughs> White man's burden, Lloyd. White man's burden. Well, they continue to carry him on, but they're he, dead inside. He, <laughs> they're dead inside. He tells them the doctor's buying it all. He was looking to score some meth. When he came across this girl who's like, hey, I can take you to this pill house and get you some meth. Turns out it wasn't a pill house. It was this farmhouse where they found the meth. And the robed ones were there, and they were slaughtering everybody who came in there. But not before they forced James to have sex in front of them while they wa- while the doctor watched. Uh, sure about that. Ritual sacrifice. All sorts of weird shit. But here's the thing. As he's saying this, the cop, Carter, is like, hey, I grew up with uh, Dr. Powell. My my family had p- 
potluck dinners with him. He's not. He, he, you're. That's not our guy. Uh, you just got a phone call from him in the office, asshole, <laughs> saying that he was. That made no sense. Yeah, that was a continuity yeah. fuck up. You just talked to the doctor and he's crazy coming back from the dead, and you're defending him to this kid. I didn't buy that at all. And uh, this is where it starts to fall off the rails for Tuttle. But basically, uh, ritual sacrifice, forced sex uh, exhibitions, dead bodies everywhere. Reminded me of some of my old house parties back at Sam Houston State University, to be yeah. honest with you. So the four of them now head down to the basement. Uh, Carter, the father, the son... Uh, Meanwhile, they're trying to calm the fucking Asian chick on the oh, whole she, uh, Asian nurse chick is just, she doesn't know what to, she just can't believe she got this assignment. She wanted to go to the hospital 20 miles down the road where Not things are mention, normal. You're a fucking nurse and you're, you've got this patient delivering a baby and you're telling her in front of her face, I don't want to be here. I, I shouldn't have been there. No, I shouldn't be here. I hate you. I hate this. It's bad writing. It's bad acting. I Actually, just, I didn't. I didn't mind that motivation. It kind of came across as a entitled kind of young. It was so over. It the was top. Dante it was from bad. Clerks. I shouldn't even be here today. Yeah, but it was so over the top. Nobody's going to react that way. I mean, even if you are the most entitled piece of shit out there. You're not going to react well, that way. Well, here's my character motivation question. The father was so hardcore up to this point. He shot the young girl in the back. He punched Allison across the ER when she got in his way. He didn't give a hot shit about anybody else's survival except him and the son. Right. All of a sudden, why the hell is he going down the basement to rescue Allison? For a guy who's openly proclaimed he ain't helping anybody but himself... He's suddenly in the mood to help. Yeah, it but makes no sense. No, why would he go to the hospital in the first place? I thought he was hunting down James. I thought he was hunting down James. Yeah, that's who he wants to kill, James. But that's my point. If he's out for himself. Why go out all that trouble? Why? Okay, true. I mean, true. Well, I mean, I, I think it was just kind of like a, a a demon hunter at this point. Well, yeah, but I mean, when he's coming into the hospital, when they first get there to the hospital, there's all those white robed figures. There's at least ten of them out there. Yeah, and he's like, nobody's leaving here. But here's my we point: we fought our way in here. He, we nobody's fought, getting, our, we why fought did you our way in, your way in here. But my point is, if he was killing everybody left and right, why did he not kill the white robed figures? Yeah, no doubt. He yeah. had a rifle. Yeah, with limited bullets. Doesn't yeah, matter. But still. He got, he's got a kid with an axe. They're raring to go. He was ready to kill everybody. I get, in that I get the sense from him. And we'll, I get the sense there. from him. We'll learn this later. His family was killed, and he blames James because he thinks James was behind the slaughter at the farmhouse. That's why he shot the girl, and he wants to shoot James. He thinks they're behind. Yeah. This. He doesn't know what's going on, but he knows they were there at the farmhouse. His family's dead. I think he's just all about killing James. But that's why I don't understand this motivation. Like, okay, you know what? I won't Wait, be well, an he had asshole. A hold, he got a hold of James. He could have killed him right then. I know. But now he's like, all of a sudden, he's like, all right, you know what? I'll use all the powers I have and go help you get Allison. Well, Makes no sense. James did yeah. name the doctor as the culprit, and the doctor's down there, so he's got to go kill the doctor. But at the same time... It, I don't to, know why he didn't just like shoot James out. To me, right. it's, to me, it's even more simple. If you were... Determined enough to walk into a hospital and kill everybody there when you first open that door, you would have killed all those white robe motherfuckers out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Or at least tried to. Yeah. Well, as they go down the basement, they discover a set of corridors where the morgue should be, and then a mysterious set of stairs going down even deeper. I'm out. On the walkie talkie, they're talking to Kim, and she's trying to guide them down there, and they're describing stairs and things that she's like i've been down there a million times what you guys are describing doesn't exist you guys are describing stairwells and quarters my job takes me down there every day that doesn't i actually thought not this there. i actually thought this was a pretty good scene i did too uh as they go down there though the father grabs james and puts him in the front you're leading the charts now he's the human shield sweet yeah. irony he used Maggie as a human shield earlier. Now you're the human shield, asshole. Uh, we cut to a dark operating room all of a sudden down below where Dr. Powell, with his back torn, turned towards us, tells Allison that uh, as she regains consciousness on the operating table that they are in uncharted territory here. 
He's operating on himself, seemingly, stitching his own wounds for the first time. Uh, although it looks more like he's removing skin, skin. from himself. He is. Which we'll learn later he is. Uh, it's hard to tell, though, with his back torn, yeah. turned towards us. When she asks how he could be back from the dead, he explains that when his daughter Sarah died, he was destroyed. He was totally wrecked. So he went looking for a solution. And Allison would be surprised at the things you find when you go looking. As Asian nurse in trading Kim desperately tries to calm Maggie down upstairs by clumsily injecting her with some sedative. She doesn't use an alcohol swab. She drops the needle on the dirty ground. That's got to be good for the baby. <laughs> pumps her full of just some mysterious amount of sedative. Uh, the guys discover weird patterns drawn all over the basement of this place. Circles, triangles. Uh, I'm sorry, the sub-basement. There's a basement below the basement. The father says that they saw similar drawings all over the farmhouse that they found full of dead bodies. Uh, he said it looked as if someone had committed surgery on all the bodies when they found them. Uh, and then dumped them in a big pile. Carter sees a blue triangle painted on a door and somehow knows, inherently, after a brief moment where he once again sees some visions, that they need to go in that door with the, the blue triangle. So t- you're checked out at this point? No, not quite yet. Okay, let me know when. You know where I'm checking out. We cut back to the doctor... Uh, in the room telling Allison that he knows what happens now when we die. You come back as something else, like a caterpillar turning into a moth. His experiments haven't been successful when it comes to this coming back process as our human bodies weren't made to... uh, They weren't made for this. And he admits that he's made some mistakes along the way with his experiments. And he says his back still turned to us. Which really works, because I think you and me are on the same. His voice yes. is perfect for this. It's all about his voice. Uh, some of these mistakes he's made are still living down here in the sub-basement. In fact, they caused the fire in the hospital because they wanted to die, but he won't let them die. He tells Allison not to cry. He's going to help her, because he's going to end the cycle of life and death. Why does she want to be a part of a world where her unborn child got strangled by the umbilical cord on the way out of her womb? She's obviously torn up, crying at the memory of her stillborn son. Strapped in the gurney. The futility of man is over, the doc says. I finally figured it out. And then he says this, Jim. I lost my daughter to the abyss, but tonight I'm calling her back. Please don't do this, she pleads, but he tells her that it's already been done. He finally turns facing us, and as he walks over to the oven table, the skin has been completely peeled off his face like Nurse Bev. Uh, this is very reminiscent of Hellraiser 2. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, when the guy... Was, and that, that's exactly what I thought. Like, a lot of the, a lot of the imagery... The stuff that's coming up is, is very Hellraiser. Very Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Very Hellraiser. Even his voice mannerisms are yeah. very Doug Bradley as Hellraiser. Right. right. I mean, very yeah, stoic that, English kind of... Right. You know, you would think a demon, but it's very cultured. It's very, very slow. Cultured. It's very... Just like Pinhead. Just like Bane. Yes. Where? I'm going to resurrect Where? the dead here. But mainly Pinhead. I mean, he had that clear, distinct... He, he told, it was a total Pinhead. Well, Even with the abominations that are coming. Dr. Powell pulls the sheet off of Allison's body on the table, and we see that she now has a giant pregnancy belly, and it's pulsating, moving around. Uh, something inside her is kicking up a storm. It's fucked up. Yeah, it is. It is totally fucked up. Or perhaps she ate the fajita omelet from Jim's diner the night oh. before. That Time. place has been closed for ten years. Oh, I guess we'll know soon enough. It's uh, fucked up. It was a creepy scene. I like. I actually like this part. I was just kind of like, all right, that's fucked up. Not I think I horror, talked dude. about my experience with the fajita omelet at Jim's diner on a, you on, a, on a past episode. Did ad nauseum because that's exactly what it caused. It caused me months of ad nauseum. Uh, and that's why Jim's is no longer a establishment in Central Texas. <laughs> that was before Yelp, by the way. That closed down on its own. <laughs> it, it, it imploded on its own weight. 
It didn't need Yelp. It didn't need. Da- I'm fairly certain Jim's had a sub basement. <laughs> I think it did. I think it did. This isn't the way to the bathroom. Wait, wait on the fajita omelet. Could I try the shrimp cocktail? You're going to need to go down to the sub basement for that. Oh. <laughs> well, as Maggie goes into labor pains upstairs, her uh, gang of guys stumbles into a slaughterhouse downstairs of severed limbs, hanging torsos off chains. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bodies everywhere. There's one figure bashing his skull up against oh. a spike on the wall. He finally pulls it off. We, a camera goes through his head. You see a hole there. And when they sh- cut across to him, it's a featureless face. Just tissue and slime hanging off. Uh, and then the shit hits the fan in All a right. very big way. Pause. The creature banging his head against the spike. I really liked. And especially I like the pull away and then the camera showing through the head to the other actors. Mm-hmm. I like that. This and now, this is once where you get past this, I'm out. When shit goes crazy, I'm out. It goes, and this is where there. Uh, this, I'm this is where it so actually reminded out. me of an older movie, also inspired by Lovecraft. Uh, I had to go back and look it up. Uh, it was called The Resurrected. Uh, early '90s. I had uh, Chris Sarandon. Okay. Uh, for those who might be familiar with the name, he played uh, Prince Humperdinck in The Princess Bride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, I've never seen this. Uh, it also, and it went by another name, or had another name attached to it, Shatterbrain. Oh, yes. Now, I, now we're on the same Yes. It, it was Shatterbrain. Yeah. You totally need to watch Princess Bride. Come on. No, but no, no, I'm, I'm this one, I, I, in effect, was almost... And this is what it is. It's like, you know, all of a sudden when I saw this stuff, I was like, oh my God. This is, this is the resurrected. This is Shatterbrain. And yeah. I was like, my God. It's also very reminiscent of the Italian uh, horror of the early 80s, Lucio Fulci. Um, just bizarre man beasts. Uh, right. Half zombies, half that don't resemble anything like man at this point. Uh, all sorts of half human, half monster creatures begin slowly. See, I was thinking more. On I was still on the Hellraiser scenes. You know, the dude with the shooting the CDs out of his skull. Yeah, uh, no, just, no, these, just these weird abomination. Type well, these, these are all of Doctor Powell's mistakes right, that, he, that right. he talked about. Uh, I thought they all looked fantastic. No CGI. No, it's, it was one hundred percent. This one hundred percent practical. I will say which, I liked. Practical effects, real world effects. I like that, but I was just like, once it reached this point, I'm like, man, they're in their in their own fashion. They're just really retreading over the Lovecraftian tropes uh, from other movies. Yeah, I mean the ancient ones. The but you know the, these are his created. He's been down there experimenting with these creatures for possibly years but i mean this was the whole point of of scatterbrain or shatterbrain was that he was trying to do resurrection and he was ended up creating all these abominations twisted yeah. malformed people well the father looks around and very aptly says we are in hell yeah i mean it's a great, great line point. no no in, in this context we are it, in it hell. absolutely worked uh, uh, I, I will say that at this point in the movie, I'm like, all right, this isn't my cup of tea. I'm checking out. Well, then you've checked out for good because it it only ratchets because the insanity the insanity from up here. from here. Uh, the sun begins to blast the monsters with his rifle. Pus and blood splatter everywhere. Uh, there's one really crazy motherfucker that starts walking on its hands. Yeah. Oh, upside yeah. down. It was like a it, Sister Abigail from WWE. And it's, yeah, very much so. And its body contorts well, the, to where well, its head's I, upside well, down. And it, then it's, what was it like, the haunting in Connecticut that it showed the the chick that well, was walking well, it's also like, like uh, in the, I origi- call this in the, the original exorcist, exorcist, the spider, yeah. the spider, the spider walk down the spider the stairs. Walk. Right, right. But it's just jaw-dropping. That it's done practically. Practical. Right. And I will say, I respect the fucking shit out of that. This is the type of stuff, I don't know if you guys saw the Silent Hill movie. No. This is the kind of stuff, if Silent Hill had used these kind of practical effects, it could have been a great horror film. Or at least a memorable one. 
But they chose to do all this similar thing, CGI, and what could have been, you know, it was a huge budget horror movie. I was about to say, Silent Hill had like five or six spinoffs. It could have been I a think it was pretty phenomenal decent. horror movie, but they chose to do this kind of stuff, CGI. Yeah. It looked like a bad video game. Yeah. These well, guys are it, actually... Well, it, it was a video game. No, it was a video game. game. But no, but it, but it, it played like a video game. <laughs> yeah. You're watching a bad CGI rendition of video game. If they had done their effects like this, I'm sorry, that, that creature contorting and its body in that kind of sausage casing just twisting and turning yeah oh dude that's money man that looks so good uh yeah i i loved it i love the practical effects in this yeah well that contorting monster then starts chasing carter and he wisely feeds the whiny uh meth head james to it because <laughs> james jumps on his back like give me your gun i gotta get out of here He's like, ah, fuck this. He just throws it right into <laughs> to the mouth of that, that thing crawling around. Uh, what did Dog the Bounty Hunter call meth heads? No. Ice heads. Ice heads. Ice Take heads. this, ice head. That's why Hollywood will not let Matt Cade make movies. <laughs> I would have totally cast the father and the son as, as Dog, Dog the Bounty, Bounty Hunter, Hunter and his son Leland, <laughs> but had them play themselves. <laughs> like they were chasing a, a, a Bond jumper. And they just happened to stumble into this this hospital. Trust me, Dog would have been cool with that casting. Dude, they have nothing but those tear gas guns that they, they have. Come on, I said. All of a sudden, his wife shows oh, up. Dude, what I, the hell are you doing? Here? I would have totally cast them in this. It would have been so much better. <laughs> Tell me that would have been better. Dog instead of the father and the son. It would have made more sense. They show up with their spray cans of mace. That's, what, that's all they've got. we got these mace cans. It's got the feathers and the... <laughs> Oh, that's, come on. That'd be awesome. Again, that's why I'm not allowed to make movies. <laughs> well, meanwhile, upstairs, a crying Kim uh, has her textbook open to the chapter on C-sections, which uh-huh. is a pregnant woman you never want to see that next to you. The nurse looking it up in a book. She, she's she got her scalpel pressed up to Maggie's giant belly, but she just can't do it. She can't make the incision. Uh, there's a sound of glass crashing from the front entrance. The robed figures are now entering the hospital. Grandpa Ben stands guard by the door as he pleads and begs for Kim, please deliver that baby. You're our only hope. You've got to deliver that baby. Kim is losing it. Asian nurse in training just can't, ha- she can't handle the pressure. Uh, by the way, Asian nurse in training who can't handle the pressure is a script that I wrote but that was about something to- totally different. Do you guys want to make that movie? No. Damn it. Fair I'm enough. on board for Asian nurse in training, but Asian nurse in training who can't handle the pressure? No. Cody, you're you're on the fence. Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Your last third of your... We, we've all catched the cigar real quick. You're on the last third. Are you still getting a lot of the same flavors? Yes. At this point, it's just chocolate. Man, I'm a fan. I'm a big fan. When August comes around, I'll be... Uh, I'll be plugging down some cash yeah. on it. Not if I I'll, buy them I'll, all. I'll definitely get some more. Okay. Uh, so beer and cigar thumbs up all the way around I'm going to have thumbs up on the beer because of the cigar the cigar really tamed the beer down for me uh, I'm smoking a Connecticut now I just want to go opposite direction from yeah. the Mexican San Andres wrapper I'll smoke a Connecticut see how, dude, the minute I lit up the Connecticut all the coffee just came back came back and, and no it needs that cigar to whip it into submission i actually went with the uh intemperance envy and you know the coffee it, it it's not like the i would think that would yeah. play nice it's actually with playing them. really nice yeah. with it as well uh no i i i agree with you i think the i like the beer because of the cigar uh it does tame that that coffee down i agree good pairing 
Which I guess makes sense since the guy who made the cigar <laughs> told us to bear it. Um, well, Maggie cannot, back to the movie, Maggie cannot slice into this belly. Um, suddenly, as she refuses to put the knife into Maggie's belly, a knife shoots through the back of Grandpa Ben's throat out the front. Just kills his ass. Blood everywhere. He drops. Yeah, it splatters on uh, Asian nurse and training. Asian nurse and training yeah. Kim. And he drops, and behind him, who killed him? We see his granddaughter, a smiling Maggie. She tells Kim to relax, because everything's about to change. Dr. Powell's an amazing man, and she's honored to be carrying his baby. Dr. P getting some action! I totally missed that. I thought it was the old man. The grandpa? The grandpa. Well, at this at this point, I've kind of checked out of the movie. I'm kind of just no. halfway paying attention to it. No, it was very important that you knew that Doctor Powell was nah. impregnating. Her. I'm I'm done with this movie. <laughs> well, that's 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 I think that's really unfair at this point. Nah. you've gotten several plot points completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this one is. Uh, well. Back down, <laughs> you totally you, just screwed up a lot of this. You really, you're really points. misunderstanding a lot of this movie. <laughs> it's not a complicated movie. Uh, well, back down in hell in the sub basement, uh, and this is a bit confusing. The father is now hallucinating that he's back in his home, and he finds his family dead. And when the son approaches him, he begins choking the son on the floor. He put Pins the shotgun against his neck. He's like, this is all your fault. He blames him for everything that's happening. We've never really been given any insight into the father-son relationship. I actually didn't think they were a father and son. I thought the father found this kid. Because at one point he says, like, I found him and everybody was dead. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they're actually... They're credited as the father and the son. I don't think it's actually his, never his son. Really, yeah. But this scene just is totally confusing. I don't know what's going on. I don't know anything that's going uh, on in this movie now. But you know what? It's supposed to be like a hellish nightmare scenario. They're not really obviously at his house. It's just a, a fever dream, a, a hallucination. Sure. And I don't know what is going on here. I'd like to. But this scene kind of lost me. Yeah, I was like... This scene lost... They haven't done any of this. They haven't done any of this, like transporting to a... a an alternative dream world. Yeah. And it lost me. And so I was just like, I don't, I don't know why they made this choice. All of a sudden now it would have been different. Like if they started trying to like shoot the deformed people and they were having like visions, this just came out of nowhere and it, it completely was misplaced. And I, I didn't like it at all because I didn't understand it. I mean, obviously it feels it made in- the relationship between father and son even more confusing than it was anyway. I didn't like it. Thumbs down. Anyways, the son fires up a road flare that he got from the Officer Carter's truck and stabs the father as he's choking him in the side with it. Not to kill him, but just to snap him out of his his dream. And as, as soon as he does, he curls up in the corner. He's like, I'm so sorry. For the first time, we see him as kind of a vulnerable guy. And he... Bad move. I'm confused on what happened to him. This late in the game to start introducing those kind of things. Bad, bad call. Yeah, I don't like it either. I'm out. I'm not out, but I don't like it. Right. I'm. I'm with him. I'm like, I don't know why they did. It. If they did it, if they had done it in the beginning, in the middle, somewhere. Other than the like the vision that what's his face was having, yeah, if you're gonna, but that was like a snippet. If you're gonna yeah. introduce those like flashbacks or alternate realities, don't do it in the last twenty minutes, man. You're gonna lose me. You're gonna totally lose me, and I'm gonna be confused, and I'm gonna get angry, which is Tut's reason. Like I'm out. I, I get that. I would now, but I didn't like it. Well, as Kim. Asian nurse in training Kim hides in a broom closet upstairs from the robe figures who've now entered the hospital in full force. And I'm sorry, that white robe figure with a triangle, I'd love that. 
I thought that that it's was imposing. Very spooky. It's imposing and spooky. It was clannish. It was scary. I told it you guys cool. this. Off, I told you guys this when we were taking a restroom break earlier. When he was out trying to originally get the uh, radio out to the in his cruiser, and the light started dimming in the parking lot, and the electricity cut out. All my years, dude, of watching horror movies, this has never happened. The electricity in my house cut out. It started <laughs> flickering. And the TV I'm watching this on went dead. And I'm like, holy shit. The movie was flickering, and now I'm flickering. And then my fire alarm started beep, beep, beeping. I'm out. It, it was weird, man. It was really weird. I've never had that happen. Honey, we're going to the hotel. Well, things are about to get full blown mind fuckity big time. Did they put the Asian nurse in the, or did the Asian nurse go in the closet? Yeah, she's in the closet at this point. Because the white robes are like, oh, she's in the closet. It's cool now. We, well, we can't go in that closet. It's what the fuck. Well, Carter uh, finally finds Allison in the sub basement on a surgery table, and she asks him to hold her hand as she smiles at him and tells him that she can feel it coming, and he grabs her hands. He looks down at her pregnant belly and then back up at her face, which suddenly crumbles like dry plaster of Paris in his hands. As we pop out to a wider shot, we see Allison is completely gutted open with slimy, like, sacks. Come on, man. Tentacles pouring out of her. You stumble on There's this. also green vine-like ropes extending yeah. from her body up to the ceiling. Dr. Powell's voice appears. She's finally what she always wanted to be, Daniel, a mother. Isn't she beautiful? No. Well, no, Daniel she... doesn't think so because he grabs that pickaxe and she looks at him and gives him the permission and he starts hacking her to pieces. Fuck yes! And all you see is I'm like... Sorry, to, through, I'm not see his out. shadow. I love, it. I love, love it. You see a shadow through the window of, of a door. Yeah, you don't see it. Like, you just see through the window with the triangle and he's door. He's going... He just... He just... Chopping her to bits. I'm not out. I love it. This is Shatterbrain, the resurrection. Oh, I'd this kill is, her. I mean, this, and so many of these. Wife. This is Lovecraft. This is in the mouth of madness from from Carpenter. This is, dude. That moment when he sees her and she's pregnant, and then all of a sudden her head just crumbles into that, dude. That's that and, is Fulci. At his best, that is Carpenter at his most eccentric. That is cinema, man. What do you like about it? Man. I loved it. Yeah. Two Just against, not my thing. Two against one. Well, Carter then stumbles out into the morgue where a giant illuminated triangle has appeared in the morgue. This huge lit up triangle. And a skinned alive nude Dr. Powell is surrounded by his robed figures, his disciples, as he calls them. Uh, he looks like one of those anatomy dummies where you just see the tendons and the muscles. Yeah. And this is where I'm going to say it's like it almost goes. Yeah, it's a, it's a completely different makeup job. But I mean, he's almost it's almost pulling like almost kind of like a full skin uh, pinhead. Yeah. Yeah. Not pinhead. Hellraiser 2. There's a guy being harvested of his skin for to feed yeah. Pinhead, and it's a, basically a guy just loss of all skin. Is right. just, he looks like a, ske a, a skeletal dummy, just yeah. tendons and muscle, but he's dark and he's slimy, and he's he's purposely removed all of his skin to move on to the next phase. Yeah, it's creepy and it works. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. He tells Daniel that he used to resist death. But now he embraces it, and he wants Daniel to join him for his own rebirth. Where Daniel sees Powell as playing God, the doctor explains the ones he serves were way predated God. Uh, they're older than God in time itself. This is pure Lovecraft. This is in the mouth of madness, the ancient ones. Cthulhu. 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 Before, Dagon. Before God, when the earth split open... The ancient ones that would crawl out. This is this is old, 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 old stuff. It's been done in movies a million times. What I can't believe is as many people as call Carpenter on this film and bring up stuff. I haven't read anyone talking about In the Mouth of Madness. This is what Carpenter did with In the Mouth of Madness. A, a, 
crazy author, Sutter Kane, summoned the ancient ones with their tentacles coming out of their faces and their, you know, people with, you know, you'd see a beautiful woman and behind her there'd be these extremities coming out and these, these dude, more than, and I looked, I read 20 reviews for this film, like, I keep hearing Carpenter in this film, nobody's talking about In the Mouth of Madness. This is In the Mouth of Madness. This is yeah, Lovecraft. This is, this is a guy summoning the ancient ones. Right. If you're going to beat God, you got to go pre-God. Right. And that's what he's doing. Well, suddenly a smiling Maggie pops up behind Carter and stabs him in the back with a big-ass butcher knife, sending him tumbling towards the triangle in Dr. Powell. Watch the abyss open to me, Pal says, as he kneels down in front of the triangle and begins chanting, much like the devil's candy chanting. I actually do like this one element slash detail is that you've got this disciple slash worshiper of some other power, but his ultimate motivation is watch me control this. No, nobody can ego, control this. Ego, but watch me. Yes, watch me. Oh, ego, ego this. is in full effect yeah. with all these with all these films. Whether it's the Fulci Italian films, whether it's Prince of Darkness, whether it's uh, Sutter Kane, and it's always an ego. Yes. I've done this. I've opened this door. It, it, there's always that central figure that wants the credit. Yeah. Dr. Powell's no different. And I, and I do like that. I do too. you got to have the madman. You've got to have the crazy madman in this. Yes. Thing. I've written tons of scripts that hinge on the insane madman who is bought, pulling the strings to everything. This guy, in a, in a movie like this, you got a guy who pulls the strings. He doesn't know what the fuck he's, he's actually done. This guy started out trying to get his daughter back. Yeah. And here we are in hell, literally. Well, sure enough, the triangle then becomes a beacon of intense light. That triangle just starts shining this bright light as a portal to the abyss opens. Maggie looks amazed as she gazes in the light and asks the doctor to bless her baby. So he does. He walks over to her and he places his hand on her head and he asks that his daughter be reborn through this vessel. I'm sure that made her feel special. Uh, I actually grabbed my wife's head during the birth of my first daughter and said the same thing. Let my spawn be born through this vessel. How'd that work out? I was not invited into the delivery room on (laughs) baby number two. Uh, Suddenly Maggie's belly literally erupts open. She's dead instantly. I mean, her whole body erupts open. Yeah, I was about to say, she is just And a splattered. giant, hideous, hairy, gooey creature emerges from her womb. You can't even describe you this can't. creature. It's really fucked up, and it's got a face that only a father could love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's disgusting. It is uh, absolutely the new, the new disgusting. Sarah Powell, his daughter makes a re- reappearance and starts marching... Uh, towards the portal uh, from out of nowhere. Uh, God, this creature is disgusting. disgusting. They did a fantastic job. I'll be honest. <laughs> In terms of practical effects, yes. I was looking at it like, ah, uh, fuck no. Well, you, do you think there's that moment Dr. Powell's like, I made it. Well, I guess those trips to the Cold Stone Creamery are out of the question. <laughs> All these things I want to do with my daughter are... I can't take this thing anywhere. <laughs> Wait a second. What have I done? Isn't she beautiful? Dude. No. We're still going to Six Flags this summer? I, Sarah, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I wanted him to like lean back toward like, hey, old God, you could have made her a little thinner maybe, you know. Maybe without the tentacles and the... Giant fangs and I was it's... expecting her to look a little more like me, just no skin. That you know? little the little portal on her uh, forehead that shoots out acid at her enemies. I don't remember <laughs> Sarah having that. <laughs> you fuckheads. <laughs> yeah, no, she's 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 bad news. Uh, well, just then the father and the son burst in with their guns, blasting. Uh, guns a blasting. There's a. 
There's a trend there. Well, Sarah chases them into an adjoining room where she traps the father underneath her with her tentacles and her spikes. I'm sorry, man. Even he's got to be like, this is a bad move. <laughs> what, what did I... They should have had that moment with him at the portal. Like, what have I done? My choices. <laughs> oh, right. My actions. But he follows through. Take some of that. You know, you've got a you got a couple open wounds. We need to get some alcohol on that. <laughs> get those things disinfected. <laughs> well, uh, she traps the father underneath her. He knows he's a goner, so he pulls out a thing of lighter fluid, squirts it all over him and her, and tells his son, "Hey, throw one of those road flares on us." Mute Matt Damon is like, eh. <laughs> he's mute. He can't talk or or <laughs> I, we, do we, anything. We we get that. So. He, Gets the road flare, throws them, and torches both of them. Uh, they both go up in smoke. Then we go back in front of the triangle portal. Uh, the doctor is starting to dissipate into smaller pieces of matter. He he's onto something here. I can see it all before me. The infinite the infinite astral workings. It's beautiful, he says. Carter crawls over to him. The large knife still firmly in his back that Maggie shoved in there. This is incredibly painful, by the way. <laughs> he looks. He looks over at uh, the doctor. Looks at Carter. I can give you back, Allison. That's what you want, and you shall have it. All you have to do is let go. Carter gets to his feet and crashes a fire. He's got his fire axe. And he crashes it, smacks it down to the region right between the doctor's head and the neck. This Nothing. Is, this is where I wish the doctor was here. The is that between your head and your neck, your shoulders? Is it the neck region? Collarbone. Clavicle. Collarbone. Cla- clavicle. 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 Uh, it does nothing. Yeah, and I will say I do like the imagery of the scenes after that, where he's got this axe just hanging out of his shoulder, and he's still talking. Calmly. And he's just like, it, it hey, does, it doesn't up? matter anything. What are you no. doing? Uh. This I is, would think you'd know by now my body is just dead. I this isn't. I have I've sacrificed peeled, myself. I've peeled all the skin off my body. I'm well, your axe. This isn't the end, Daniel, he says. To which Daniel, in his best hero gravelly voice, says, Yes, it is. So he lunges up yes, and grabs is. the doctor and they go shoot through the porthole, through the triangle. As soon as they go through it, immediately it goes from a bright light to black and then the triangle completely disappears and the morgue is completely silent like it never happened right I don't understand elsewhere in the sub meanwhile in the sub basement Sarah Powell remember her the giant beastly uh, whatever this thing is is back in action Uh, she's she's a bit crispy now because she got set on fire but she's a couple of dates like this (laughs) it's just like oh thanks match.com well, my dad is a doctor. I like that. Pay for the Go wedding. On. I died years ago. What was this? Picture from 20 years ago? Come on. This is not you, Sarah. This is not you. You said nothing about tentacles. You said nothing about your vagina having teeth. I don't think we ever saw the vagina. Thank God. No, I think we did. We might not have recognized it, but well, we probably did. she's chasing mute Matt Damon, the son, through a series of tunnels until he's suddenly kicked out. He's like spit out of the tunnels into a hospital. Well, it's like the walls are the walls like close in on him, in. and then it spits him out into the hallway of a hospital. And he looks behind him, and there's not even a tunnel there. No, it's like a wall. It's like he imagined. It. Yeah, it's like a wall. There's no sign that he was ever in. There. And once again, that's very more much like a Hellraiser. Very Hellraiser, very Lucci or Fulci. I'm going to get to the Fulci connection later, but yeah, it, 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 it makes no sense. I was waiting for him to undo his Rubik's Cube. You, no, you wait for him to look at that wall in the Blaine Predator voice. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the f- But he can't talk. <laughs> what what the fuck? Well, at least he can mouth the words. He, he should know the he words. Should. What the fuck? That would have been funny. What, what the, the fuck? fuck? What the fuck? That's bad. You did it first. I know. You should be ashamed of yourself. I am. I am disgusted. He's not really mute. He's an actor. It's mute Matt Damon. 
God love it. <laughs> well, you Matt Damon didn't. Uh, he goes around the hospital and he finds all sorts of dead bodies everywhere. He's just looking everywhere. There's dead bodies, including. Do you see the one guy in a white lab coat with no head? No. As he's looking around the dead bodies, there's a guy and there's a body in a white lab coat with no head. Who's that? I never saw I that know. happen. I'm checked no, out. I'm thinking that might have been a deleted scene that we never saw or yeah. doctor True. that we never saw. Sure. He sees a, a a pharmacist or somebody with no head. Sure. Is that stereotyping? A white lab coat? It's a pharmacist. <laughs> well, it could be anybody that works a in a hospital. He finally discovers Asian nurse in training Kim in a broom closet. Is it over? She runs out. To which he hugs her and nods. He, <laughs> A yeah. lot, of, lot of nodding in his future. It don't work. <laughs> Did he still do that's, it? You, uh, that's, uh, that's all he's going to do for the rest of his life is nod. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. No, I have a close friend that's deaf. I'm allowed to do this. Oh, okay. No. In that case. I don't think you're allowed to do that. No, you're not. He'd whip my ass. No. He'd whip your speaking no. ass. The son is going to learn some sign language, and everyone's going to ask him, he's going to go, what happened? He's going to just basically sign for, that was some fucked up shit. <laughs> How do I sign insanity? Uh, that is just fucked up. I mean, how do you... The guy peeled his skin uh, off. A guy I peeled killed his my skin dad off. with a crazy tentacle beast. Well, we still don't know. If, I don't think that was his dad. I don't think the father was. No, that was his dad because he was well, like, I blame you for. the father and the son. Yeah, he was like, I, mean, I blame you, you for mom's death. Nothing in the movie gave us that, though. IMDb calls him the father and son. I IMDb never. Don't he lie. said at one point, I found him and everyone else was dead around. I, I, I rescued him. I never got that they were actually father and son. I did. He treated him like a he son. He did treat him like a son. I did. Yeah, I thought I thought they were. Why weren't and you there to solve the problems that I couldn't solve? You failed me at every instance. You let your mom die. Well, he's certainly speaking like a father. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> we're terrible. Yes, it's terrible. We are. We just offended deaf people. Well, they're not. I doubt they listen to many podcasts. <laughs> we're just. Hey, hey we should sure a hole. Now, Stop digging. to help our hearing assisted listeners, Garrett Morris. <laughs> <laughs> he can't. He, all right, sorry. I totally um, want to run for city council. No, I can't. No, no, you couldn't 50 episodes ago. You're screwed. <laughs> Well, we cut to then the rising... First of all, did it piss you guys off? That the only ones to survive this shit are the horrible Asian nurse who was chicken shit and wouldn't help anybody and Mute Matt Damon? I like Mute Matt Damon. I thought Mute Matt Damon... To say it's face. always the last one no, you I, know, I, I actually, loved him. He's great. I actually thought Mute Matt Damon was one of the more interesting characters of the entire deal. I will give him this. He acted more with just his facial expressions exactly. than all these others acted with all their their faculties. Exactly. Grandpa I, I Ben's just, horrible. Horrible. Father's horrible. Asian Kim was Asian horrible. Asian nurse in training Kim I, was I just, horrible. There were so many Wait horrible actors second. in here. I actually like me, Matt Damon, from an Wait actor standpoint. He just said, Ben earlier said, you're our only hope. Old Ben saying you're our only hope? A little Star Wars reference. Oh. Uh, Right there. No, that, guy, that guy was no Kenobi. It was no but Kenobi. he was still an old Ben. He was an old Ben. The old Ben convention. I think it was like the old Ben Rice old Ben. <laughs> <sighs> it's not, no, not wait, good. Uncle Ben? Uncle no. Ben. No, Uncle Ben was black. Yeah, this guy This guy is not. Is he's movie, old Ben. Is this old movie ben. over yet? I wonder if he means old Ben. You mean the crazy old coot out back? <laughs> yeah. I really, the guy that's way too interested in his granddaughter's pregnancy. I really need this movie to be over with. <laughs> what are you talking about? And I was pretty sure that wait, old wait, Ben knocked We haven't even gotten up. to the most interesting... <laughs> dude, dude, he thought 
Old Dude. Ben knocked up the granddad or granddaughter. That's what I thought up until when she said that she was carrying Dr. Powell's kid. I was like, that sweet old granddad knocked up his Well, granddad. you know, it would have been more... Con- it would have been- That's how fucked up we are. Well, at least... <laughs> if old Ben at least had looked over at, le- at once at the granddaughter, but like, slut. <laughs> well, he did say something at one point like, I don't want to be driving 20 miles extra every time this kid has a thing. And what if she was like, well, it's your fucking kid, Ben. Uh, oh, uh, hey, 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 hey. And then hey. you Matt Dame's like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> That's when you Matt Damon puts on the white hood. I, I can't be him doing them. <laughs> That'd be horrible. That's, again, why I'm not allowed to make movies. I would have Matt Damon, you Matt Damon, put on the hood and be like, I'm out. LD 5000. Beef. It's horrible. It's terrible. But he's not really deaf. No, he's not. He had his throat ripped out. He, had his he wasn't born ripped. deaf. I'm no. not going to make fun of he those. He can hear. Guys. He can talk. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'm not talking for the. I'm not talking for the rest of the movie. <laughs> you just talk like. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Our sponsors are fleeing left and right. They know what they signed up for. Well, well, we we cut to the rising sun in the morning. Pink clouds hovering over uh, trees. Birds singing. Uh, the world as we know it is is fine once again. Until we cut to the exact fucking opposite of all that good stuff. We're suddenly back in the world of black clouds and scorched earth. Only this place looks nothing like earth. Uh, Daniel and Allison stand together looking out into the abyss. Uh, looking up at a giant black triangle up in the sky surrounded by lightning and terrifying sky. Now, and I was trying, and I, I went back and looked at it, because it was really hard. Because, once again, bad lighting, I don't know what it affects. But is it supposed to be a black triangle? Is it supposed to be a black pyramid? It's a pyramid. Is it it's pyramid? totally a pyramid. Okay. Yeah. It's a giant black pyramid in this new world that they're in. Uh, stormy skies. The void. Lightning, the void. They're in the void. They're in the, they're in hell. They're in... They're just in another dimension. Another dimension. So they hold hands. Uh, she's back in her scrubs and her physical form. I she don't like that part. And they're... I mean, at least he got his Allison back. Trapped and... in this new world. And there you hold hands and then we cut. End of movie. I kind of like that part. I mean, if I'm going to be in hell... But you know, you like stranger it's, danger, it's, there we're it's gonna hold not hands hell. And I mean, it's just it's a different. It's not dimension. hell. It's a different dimension. Yeah. Or maybe it was hell. Or maybe it was hell. I, I, I don't know. I don't think it was hell. I think it was another dimension. Uh, I don't know. With all the fucking creatures that are walking around Earth, getting into this portal. But they weren't there. It was just them and. Nothingness. Where, where'd and the doctor go? And oh, you know he'd be he'd be around. I would think so. I mean, the guy pushed. Well, I, him I'm thinking the, maybe the doctor got it wrong, misinterpreted the signals. They're now there, and they're whole. She's back to looking the way she was. I don't know, man. I didn't get the impression they were gonna like. Build a house and start a new life <laughs> in this dark. Under well, the I'm, not, I'm not under, saying under, that. under the black pyramid with lightning, eternal lightning and fire. Hey, babe, this is us now. I don't know this. As soon as they had all the abominations show up, which were cool in a practical sense, but in terms of a story sense, I'm out. I, I just I wasn't out. Uh, I love the creatures. I don't know. I, what right. you, I don't know what you're trying to tell me. I just well, let me let me break this down into influences because that's what this movie is getting hammered with since its release is wearing its influences on its sleeve. I can't believe because when I told the doctor that we were doing this movie, he's like, "I'll be really curious what you see." I hear it's very Carpenter esque, 
uh, every time somebody hears that about me, they look to me like, what do you think? It's Carpenter. What do you think? There I was, I did not find it very Carpenter. No, there was only hints. Right. I found to vi- Carpenter. Visual, right. I found in terms vi- of visual tributes to Carpenter. Right. But the film was not shot like Carpenter. The no. film was not scored like Carpenter. No. no. Yes, there were the, the every time a, a a figure would would lose the skin off his face. That's a that's a Prince of Darkness move. Uh, yeah, but but the, the, but, the gateway, but Carpenter the gateway, wasn't the only person who did that. Of course not. But the gateway to a a parallel plane is very Prince of Darkness. Uh, that was the whole point of Prince of Darkness was a gateway into hell. But like I said, he wasn't the only person to no, do that. No, he wasn't. But, but but I I got that. I got you know there were some flourishes of the thing with the creature effect. Right, right, right. Very. But right. I didn't read this anywhere. But I saw a lot of in the mouth of madness. Yeah, no, this effect. was the ancient this ones. Ten was in the mouth entirely of was what a Lovecraftian. Carpenter. Yes. All right, so obviously if you're picking and, that up, and, and very you're picking mu- up Carpenter and stuff. No, but very much like in Mouth of Madness, it was a, a madman, Sutter Kane, using his body as a vessel to open up the, yeah. our world to the world of the ancient well, ones. Well, I right. can... Who've I have been can, around since before God, well, before you know, and this, and, and this is a... And like I said, and people use it all the time, this is directly a Lovecraftian horror. Right. Yeah. That... And to that, paint this though as a these guys are ripping off Carpenter and no. it's, it's a it's a that's a lazy paint of the criticism brush. Well, like I said, you and see I a couple effects that remind it. you of the thing. Yeah, or, I mean, and I'm like, okay, even I pick that up, but I'm like, I would not call this Carpenter. No, no, no. no, no. no. I mean, they I picked would, up like two or three scenes. Boom, I would, that's I it. would, not I would say the guest is way more of a love letter to Carpenter than this movie ever was. Correct. There was some aspects of this movie that definitely were Carpenter. For like I said, the 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 empty hall, the the environmental montage. Well even more than the, that. The the creature effects. Tut, even more than that. That's definitely it's, Carpenter. It, it, it's it's in its early essence, it's a siege movie. It's assault on precinct thirteen. There's these right. cr- there's these figures that went. But Carpenter wasn't the only one who's done a siege no, movie he's not. either. You know the, the assault on precinct thirteen Assault on Precinct Thirteen was basically Rio Bravo, where the bad guys were right. That's that's Howard Hawks. Uh, I thought these guys showed their own style. I did their yeah. own uh, approach to music and pacing, which was very uncarpenter like. Uh, I also have heard a lot of criticisms about it, especially the end when they're in this alternate void. Void uh, to Lucio Fulci's The Beyond, which is one of my my favorite. Uh, directors and also one of my favorite horror movies, The Beyond. Uh, for our listeners, The Beyond, uh, an old New Orleans hotel, uh, back in the 1920s, uh, it it's it it sits on one of the seven gateways to hell. In the 1920s, they do a ritual sacrifice of a guy there, and then we skip ahead to 1981. A young woman inherits the hotel, and all this weird shit happens, and it's still an open gateway to hell. And at the end, her and her husband go down and do the sub base. I don't know if it's a sub basement, but it's a basement. A basement. <laughs> and just like this, they enter an alternate reality, a hell. It's a, a vast landscape. It's their basement, but it's a vast universe of low hanging clouds, dead, stacked bodies, this kind of rocky climate. Their eyes immediately go from blue to clear white. Uh. That's hell. I never got the impression in this movie that this alternate was hell. Was hell? It was something just different. void. It was yeah. a, it was something different. The void, if you will. Um, it reminded me so much the end of the Beyond. I can get I get those comparisons. I get I get. Well, that. I, I just you know there there's so much you know even with music you have influences as a musician. To where if you really idolize a player, you're going to pick up aspects of your influences. And then it's really easy to criticize that person like, that good dude plays just like Jimi Hendrix. Well, if you're a very, if you're a student of that style, that influence is going to seep into your own work. I thought that Carpenter's influence was there, but like you said, I didn't think that this was a... Uh, Carpenter movie by any stretch of the means because not only did you have the Carpenter influence 
how many references did we make to Hellraiser, Hellraiser Two? You know, there there are definitely other other Much IPs so. out I, there. I, I thought these guys showed their own their own approach to things. And I, I did. I respect yeah. that. I, respect I didn't that. like it, but you know, I can I can see where they're coming from. I thought that their storytelling was just fucked up. I I. There were so many times where I didn't understand character motivation. Honestly, Ted, I didn't understand what I, story they were trying to say. Honestly, Ted, I, just, I was okay with the, the the story arc. I was okay with everything that happened at the end. My biggest criticism of this film is the acting. I thought if they had, but to me that comes down to storytelling. What? You have you have a father who knows everything, and then all of a sudden is like, wait. I need well, you to tell me no, the no, answers no, no, to all no, no. this First shit. of all, he came into like, that hospital like he on, knew man. everything. And then we finally kind of got the sense he knew nothing. And right. we didn't really get why he was there. But but you no. didn't but you didn't see like... And where he got the sun. We, but, but you a didn't, lot of unanswered questions. Uh, it would have been different if he like busted through the hospital like, I know everything. And then well, once the story unfolded, he's like, oh shit, I don't know anything. You never got that from the actor. No, you, you never, never got that from but the portrayal. No, but, you know, even when he said like... Well, you guys aren't getting out alive, but I am. Like he knew something. He didn't know anything. No, I just, and, and I like just didn't said, you know, with the, the whole anything. dream sequence. I feel like there was some editing choices made, and they were made wrongly. Why not show a dream sequence with the cop and his wife and the daughter lost? Well, I mean, yeah. just if they had done something it came like out of that, blue yeah, and they showed they showed enough flashbacks of the other people. They should have. They That's your central character. They I could, just they could have or the doctor losing his honestly, girl. I just honestly yeah. where this movie sunk with me, it didn't sink. I liked the movie. Meh. <laughs> you liked it too. No, it, it didn't. He didn't. For what it was, it was decent. Yeah. Uh, I did not. I thought the the acting shortchanged. Man, if they had gotten better actors or directed the actors, they had better. Spend, Maybe. spend as much time on the acting as you did on the creatures. Yeah. It's so important. And that that's Carpenter. The thing would be nothing if it weren't for Wilford Brimley and Kurt Russell and Keith David. Yeah. Getting those performances right is what makes the shit that happens with the creatures great. Well, that's what I'm saying. If those yeah. guys suck, if those guys are confused on what their motivations are and how to act scenes, those they brought in creature I mean, scenes don't mean shit. You have to be able to have a masterful grasp of your actors and your effects that's where Carpenter rocks well, I mean, rocks. If, if, if you, if you, you don't have you guys well, lost they had, they had it two. You, had no, you had no grasp on your acting you concentrated so much on your practical effects which were great it's a it's a balance boys you, you, you gotta get, have you lost the actors the there. You, you gotta lost have the, balance. the people that, you gotta have the salesman you gotta have the salesman well, you know, I, I kept thinking if, if if a real actor had played that father, because that father is basically the Quint role of Jaws. Well, so, okay, no. Here, I know here's a real here's a real I case can... in point. I really feel like you know if they'd put the uh, the uh, three hundred men went the into cop, the sea, uh, Art Hindle, men came he out. should have been the father. He's got some chops. Oh, the marsh, the the, 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 the sheriff, state, the state trooper, yeah. He's got the acting chops to carry that. He showed role. great chops in his little limited role. He showed some stuff. Well, what I'm saying is, I mean, trick, he has been. I'm saying get get a guy to play that father who can act. Yeah, I think I think uh, he would have been far better. Fritz Beer. I mean, that guy. Playing the father would have been better as Fritz the sheriff. Could have, Fritz could because he's done only it, in like three scenes. Yeah, he would have been far better. And get the other guy that has and has done horror films. Yeah, I just I, I just didn't buy it. I, I mean, he <sighs> did Body Snatchers. He did The Brood. But dude, just picture this: Dan Stevens, the from the guest, the main the mm-hmm. guy in the the guest. <coughs> Picture him as the cop. Yeah. An actor. <coughs> who would look like a cop, act like a cop, still convey conflicted things about his ex wife and all that. Could stand his own in every acting scene. And get I a, think get a get a get a get a an actor of that quality as a cop. 
then pair him with an actor of that same quality as the father. Honestly, I I didn't object to the guy who played the cop. Dude, he just didn't. Dude, he's got long, greasy hair, Out, outside, scruffy. Outside of the physical appearance, I'm of sorry, him. dude. You're not going to be a cop looking like that. Out, but again, you know, that, and, to and me, and that's you, you know, he's actually right because it is me, should you're have been trying to be. Yeah, they kept saying you're, you're trying to be you're like trying your to dad, be your father. You should have been trying to be super cop. Well, he should have been. He should have been neat and clean. Neat and he clean with been, a mustache. And that and all those things though about his dad went nowhere. We never no. learned what happened to his dad. No. We, that's why I didn't even really mention it much in my notes because we never learned like did his dad die in duty? Did we never learned anything? Yeah, uh, it was something that everyone kind of threw in his face, but we never really. It never went anywhere. I, th- I think that's the the funny thing about it is is that when you distill it all down, you know, in the last, uh, you know, you you can't scare if you don't care. I, I didn't really care about anybody in this movie. It was the same thing with the uh, the houses that October built. You know, he had an interesting yeah. concept there, but I really didn't care about anybody yeah. that was in that movie. I, I, I cared about Allison, the the nurse it, and the mom. She was really good. Kind of. She outshined everybody in this movie, that actress. True. I agree. I thought, unlike Tut, I think we're in agreement, the doctor did what he was supposed to do. He, yes. I thought his voice was why they hired him, because so much of it is in that voice. Yeah. I thought he was good. I thought he was really, really good. It's but calm. Outside it's... the doctor and Allison, I thought everyone should be recast and get a do-over. Let's make remake this movie with good actors. I re- well, honestly, I really think they should have taken the sheriff and put him as the father. It couldn't have been any worse. At least cast him as the grandfather. Something. Yeah. Or cast an Atkins like guy as the father, where you know he's. He's doing a shot and like he just just burn out, but he's still trying to play the part. Yeah. In Halloween three, he was still shaving every day. He shaved that mustache and he still showed up looking the part. Yeah. That's Carpenter. His guys showed up to play the part. These guys just showed up like schlubs. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't care for him. I, there was no emotional attachment I agree. to me. Um, so that that's just touching a little bit on. As much attention as this movie's gotten about its influences, I, I don't think it. I don't think it was a deal breaker for me. I, I, th- I thought it was. They wore their influences well, and they didn't uh, ride the coattails of right. Fulci or Carpenter. But I will say this: that as much as I didn't appreciate the movie, I do appreciate that they tried, that they threw the genre out there. It's such I a. Love, I love that end scene. Even if it is totally rip off of the Beyond, correct. I, lo- I actually kind of liked it. I love. I actually did. Like I love it. that. You know what? They're together and they're in this weird. Biz- Fuck it. That's great. I kind of liked it. I, I, I liked it too. I kind of picture me and Stranger Danger sitting there. And- this is our life now. Fuck it. Where's Charles Mortimer? Grab my hand and let's <laughs> just let's do it. That's what we're doing. It's gonna be an eternity of misery, but <laughs> we're, in, we're in it together. Isn't that what marriage is? Do they have beer here? <laughs> no. Here's your Coors Light. No. Uh, I, one other point I want to mention: um, as filmmakers, we did a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign years ago, um, trying to get a, a feature film off the ground. These guys it failed miserably. It failed miserably. Thank you, fuckers. I think we raised about five thousand dollars, which. Uh-huh. Is- Hey, 5,000 wasn't wasn't bad. 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 Uh, These guys, because of their history with Astron 6 and the films they had done, they uh, reached out because as this film was getting in pre-production, they're like, we need to get started on making our creatures. Okay. This movie needs to have handmade prosthetic creatures. Didn't they they bring like an A-game troop to do the creatures? Yeah, but one of those guys is the director. Yeah. He's... So they reached out on Indiegogo, which is a crowdfunding source, and to their credit, they raised over eighty thousand dollars on Indiegogo just to make the creature effects for this movie. That's pretty decent. I think it's admirable. It to, is to use their fan base to re dude anybody that can. 
crowdfund successfully has my thing. But, dude, they raised $80,000 to make these monsters. And, dude, I'm telling you, I watch every goddamn horror movie that comes across the radar. They look so good. No, no, they their did. practical was just... It and was there was on point. Not a, there was not one sliver of CGI in no. these things. And, and I think... And, and I always appreciate that more because it... Because it always looks real. Well, even, well I mean, even the, there was there was points where you know the doctor is <laughs> the doctor, uh, the doctor is standing in front of the triangle portal, and I can tell that's a rubber suit. But at the same time, I'm I'm forgiving of that because it looks visceral. I mean, there, I, he's actually up there. I in always that suit. You know that my, that's my, my a guy sus- there. My that's suspension a, that's of disbelief there. goes away with and that. And as yeah. his daughter is reborn in that hideous creature that we couldn't even describe because we're so grossed out, with that face and that hunchback and the tentacles, there's something that's kind of cool about that. Because it was real. Because they actually made this thing. And whenever they would hit it with an axe and that ooze would splash out of it, it was real flesh and ooze and material material I mean, just, and, and you know yeah. what? they actually got eighty thousand dollars from their fans to do it right and that's the saving grace of this film was practical effects yeah i have not seen practical effects done this well in a horror movie in a long time i think if you remove the yeah if if you remove the practical effects from this film it, it's a turd like I said, Silent Hill was a huge budget, $100 million horror movie that was supposed to be the next Shining. The minute... It those, still did the pretty minute, good, though. The minute those contorted bodies, like what they did in here brilliantly, they did CGI and it looked like CGI, and she went down in these, these, these sub-basements of Silent Hill, and there's all these weird contorted things that were clearly computer animated yeah these fuckers actually made it i will say the the backward bend creature that was just kind of weird the silent hill kind of backward bend the the sister abigail from wwe it looked good it really looked good and it it looked looked, great and And it it was creepy even though that i know that that's you know rubber suit practical effects to me, that looked a lot better than that Silent Hill CGI. I agree. And or I, the the haunting in Connecticut, where I think they did the same thing. I was just I like, lo- I, I do love this new wave that we're kind of seeing of indie horror films with Deathgasm, with this. We've got a Turbo, mix with Turbo Kid. Where you have that mix. Where you have that. You know what? We're gonna do some things digital. This movie didn't. Yeah, but other movies were. But we're gonna also do some things. Remember Turbo Kid, where the guy like landed on another guy. <laughs> we're gonna do some shit. The Turbo Kid, even going back to the uh, Corman deal, the uh, Death Race twenty fifty or whatever. Whenever we're gonna they show had a guts, mix of both. we're gonna show guts falling down on you. Right. We're gonna show it's real blood practical. and real guts. Yeah. yeah. Even Expendables couldn't do that. Every bloodshot in Expendables was digital. Yeah. And we're like, yeah. God, man, this movie. Can- Even like Rambo, yeah. Rambo, when uh, they did the where he's on the fifty cal and uh, he's just mowing down the Laotian. Don't you talk bad about the fifty cal scene? Deal. No, I liked it. But even that stuff, like when the blood and guts was hitting the camera lens, and was they was not was not killing Lo- Laotians. They were Myanmar's. 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 You have a thing against Laotians? No, I just I've had a couple of bad servants. Some bad massages. Uh, I thought. I thought the fact that they were able to raise eighty thousand through crowdsourcing was beyond admirable. But you know what? They they formed this thing ten years ago, Astron Six, and they got a following. And yeah. They made some movies, and kudos, man, bravo, boys. I was about to say, I going through the process myself. Uh, it, it's a hard thing to do. So yeah, you can't really knock them for it. I am thumbs up on this film. Uh, I was really, and I think uh, the doctor, when I talked to him, was expecting me to be like Carpenter rip off. Because I, I shit all over It Follows because of very similar things. I, I thought it was trying to be 
clever. I never thought this movie was trying to be clever. I thought it was very straightforward. And I thought the direction was very straightforward. Yeah, right. uh, man, I'm... Yeah, thumbs up to the void for me. Thumbs down to the void for me. I liked it. Boo. It worked. Two out of three. Ain't bad. Cigar, I think we're all three... Three thumbs, thumbs up. up. I'm going to have to revisit the Zlatno songs from earlier in the year because that was by far my favorite of the year that Connecticut that Riste did it was yeah but this is right up there I'm saying this is one and two so far mm. the awesome price point is ridiculous holy shit man if you factor price point in this cigar it's hands down the best cigar we've done I know that's a big thing for you 550 come on 550 for tonight's cigar is amazing um, Un fucking heard of. And, I, and it and it paired. Uh, by the way, I I switched to a Connecticut to go with the beer. I I, I want to try this cigar with an actual cup of coffee. See what it actually does. That actually probably be fantastic. I think it would. Yeah. Honestly, any cigar in the morning with a cup of coffee and no <laughs> kids screaming at you would be amazing. That's the way I kind of look at it. Uh, any cup of coffee with a cigar and no cat, you know, meowing at me. It's, it's uh, but you know what? I will give the I will give the beer a, a thumbs up. It was a little overpowering with the coffee uh, once the cigar was done, but it paired wonderfully during the during the run of the cigar. So I'm gonna give the Founders Breakfast Stout a thumbs up. You boys? I like it. Uh, I will drink it again and again. I'd like to drink this for breakfast with a cup of coffee. Man, I, I, I don't know. Uh, You're going to give all the credit to the it cigar. It is thick. It I, is I delicious. I, I mean, I'm not saying it's it's the ideal thing. Oh, I just had a hot day. You guys know me. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't like coffee stouts at all. I'm not a fan. But uh, but I did enjoy it. I liked it. Yeah. With the cigar, it paired very, very nicely. I don't know what it would be like without the cigar. Uh, and like I said... Well, I, you've been smoking... You've been drinking it with a different cigar, is it? Yeah, I, I had the Intemperance Envy. Uh, and no. it was fine. It was... No change. I, I was fine with it. I just... I don't know what it would be like without Sans Cigar. Sans. Sans Cigar. All right. I've heard it both ways. Yeah. Well, interesting movie and a good cigar. You can't beat that. Yeah, whatever. <sighs> Too true. This guy. Good cigar. Eh, mediocre movie. I disagree. I think, I think we're in a cool place where some interesting movies are coming out. Uh, we saw it with Devil's Candy. We saw it with this movie. I love the fact that we're actually getting thriller, horror elements back into this thing. And you know what? Uh, if if the three of us are willing to spend seven bucks, somehow you got it cheaper. Yeah, because I'm awesome. I, <laughs> I had one option, seven bucks for Amazon. Mm, but you know what? I've heard a lot about it. I want to see it. I'll pay seven bucks. <laughs> I thought it was good. I like the fact that, you know, there's so much. At least you're getting money on, like, George Romero. I, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm, uh, I, I'm a huge comic. By law, I have to inform you that George Romero You're taking receives advantage the, of the original Masters of Horror. I'm a huge comic book nerd. By and law. I love all the comic book love that's come out in the last, you know, five years. But at the same time, Steve I'm like... Dick, Steve Dicko gets no love. But at the same time, I mean, Steve like... Steve Dicko is the George Romero. There's so comic. many genres out there. There's so many stories that can be told that aren't superhero related. So I, I, I like the fact that people are, you know, bringing new stuff out there. Dude, this Maybe it's not in my wheelhouse, dude, but I still respect it. There are guys making generic zombie invasion movies. Zombies are invading this hospital and they have to find them. These guys actually came up with a backstory to these cloaked figures in these yeah. hoods. 
They came up with a a, a doctor with a a, a world changing God mission, fetish, which I've written. A, you know, none of y'all read it, but I wrote a script with a similar thing. A, a doctor who was trying to change the world um, with a broad stroke of of genetic evolution. I mean, it's it's. It, it, it's doing something different, man. And and, and then uh, I'm not going to totally shit you're on gonna, it because of that. You're going to pair that with great creature effects, subpar acting. God, man, hire good actors. Don't hire fucking. But see, that's, that's one of the things an old that guy, an old guy at the community theater. Hey, you could be Grandpa Ben. No, he can't. Yeah. Grandpa Ben could have been a cool character if if it was a good actor. I, that, that's what irked me about this movie was. The lack of good actors. But I will say this: I, I I love that we live in an age to where, because of social media and because of the dissemination of information, sure, dissemination of information, dissemination of information. Uh, that's kind of weird. <laughs> I I love the fact that these stories can get out there to where they're not gated by you know Hollywood studios. I, I I like the fact that we're living in a pretty nice, pretty nice little well, don't, video. Well, don't don't okay. steal it, rent it. Some more of these movies can be made. Absolutely, I'm sure the void can be watched for free. Some on it's some seven pirate. fucking bucks. Pay it. Pony up the fucking money and let the guys get paid. Just like for all your fucking musicians out there, music isn't. Free. Just fucking pay the artist. God. I agree. I'm sorry. As, as much as Lars from Metallica is a dickhead, he still deserves to be paid if you like his music. No, that doesn't mean you have to pay for the 15 renditions of the copies that you get. But at least pay him one time. Come on. They're rich. They don't need my money. Yes, they do. Because Thanks, they're Black giving Album. You content. At least, at least pay him once. Pay them everything. Well, he can't get his golden dolphin bar <laughs> this time, but maybe <laughs> next time. Tell, uh, give us some links. Uh, oh, You're my drunk. God. I put a fork in me. Uh, Tuesday night, Cigar You're not Club nearly on. as drunk as you were last episode on our 50th special. Oh, that's which hasn't true. hasn't happened yet. That's true. But it will. Or has it? Oh, we we've talked. Just set up air mattresses at the pub. We'll just sleep there. You, you yeah. can't. You can't. Why? It's haunted. I'm not saying. You I wake, wake up. up. I don't need night terrors. Look, you, if you want to wake up <laughs> and you terrors. want to see the black triangle hovering above you, that's your own deal. I'm out. I'm out. I'll Go to uh, Tuesday Night Cigar Club on Facebook. Hit at TNCC Cast uh, for Twitter. Go to TNCC underscore podcast for Instagram. That's about it. Join the YouTube channel. That's pretty damn cool. Yes, it is awesome. It's the best way to watch it. You get to see all this. It is fantastic. Soak in my beautiful Bose headphones. If you don't watch us on YouTube, there's no reason I need to suck in for three hours. <laughs> all those hours in the gym are wasted. Boys, this was fun. It was. It was. Uh, what else can I add to this? Nothing. Well, I'm looking at the sea of... Uh, Beers and I'm impressed, dude. I, I'm absolutely impressed. By my uh, sea of uh, consumptions? Yes, because I know how I'm feeling after my consumption. I'm like, holy shit, dude. I am an internet beer expert. No. You have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 well, something we'll talk about. And it has nothing to do with your beer consumption. That's something we'll talk about when the cameras go off. <laughs> I love that when you're like looking at what you drank and you're like hero and then the other guy's like you have a problem (laughs) by this booze combined I am an asshole (laughs) by the booze combined I am an asshole uh, the father the son and the drunken ghost
At any rate, congrats on 50 and 51. Yeah. We're still here. We're still doing what we do. Congrats on three years in a row, the best live action music venue in Central Texas. We try. We try. It's a night of celebration. It is a night of celebration. Uh, 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 may the wings of liberty, boys, never lose a feather. Sign our motherfuckers. We'll see you next week. To learn more about the time I was sucked into a bizarre otherworldly dimension where human beings took on terrifyingly disfigured forms and all the norms of a civilized society were completely absent and replaced by chaos and lunacy. Please, read my online short story titled An Afternoon at Arby's. One man's upside-down hellish descent into a beef and cheddar nightmare. Available at KeithAHowell.com. And uh, in the meantime, to learn more about the cigars and libations enjoyed on tonight's episode, you can visit www.jassomcrawl.com and www.foundersbrewing.com. An upside-down descent. Does that mean you're going up or down? For more on O'Brien's Irish Pub, the live music leader in Central Texas, please visit O'BrienSimple.com and download their free smartphone app, where you'll find full beer listings including over 40 on tap, menu information, and a calendar of upcoming live events. To listen and purchase music heard on tonight's program, check out www.fritzbeermusic.com. Thank you for listening to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club Podcast. This is Keith A. Howell saying, until next time, friends, unless we see you sooner at the pub. So keep it smoky, and for God's sake, keep it ballsy as well. <laughs>